The sun comes out And it's a new day I'm gonna make it on my own The sun comes out I'm in a new way I gotta pack my things I'm going home Let's build a house We'll have a backyard Something beautiful Something with a view Let's build a house Just for me and you
Welcome. Please fill in the seats near the front of the room. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Rich Fulcher, and I lead the material design team. I'm Josh Estelle. I'm uh, the engineering lead for material design. And I'm Rachel Bean, the creative director for material. Thanks for joining us. In the dev keynote, uh, we just announced a comprehensive update to material design. I feel like I actually recognize a few people from the dev keynote. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. We are going to talk about material theming which is Material Design's new approach to customizing apps, powered by open source components, new tools, and new design guidance. 
we've created all of this work focused around two major goals. First, we wanted to do more to improve the designer to developer workflow. That was a big focus for us in this work. We want to make it faster and easier to build custom and improved experiences. And second, we wanted to make Material much more adaptable and much more flexible so that more varieties of products and different styles of brand can come to Material and take the benefits of it. This talk today is going to be focused on that aspect of customization, how you move from customizing in design to realizing that customization in code. So we'll cover both halves of that. We launched Material Design in 2014 as a way of creating a unified, cross-platform set of experiences. It was a design system not just for Google, not just for Android, but for everyone. And we wanted it to be able to span mobile, desktop, and other devices along the way. And since then, we've seen an incredible amount of beautiful and usable products produced by you, built on the foundations of material design. As an example, we have these winners of previous year's material design awards. So many of these great experiences, from the New York Times to Airbnb to Blinkist, succeed because, that they are, because they're able to bring their brand to bear. They bring the strength of the identity they've already established into the forefront of the experience. Without, custom, without compromising any sense of predictability or introducing confusion for the user. With material theming, you can create a custom theme of material which is personalized for your product, expressing its brand through color, type, and shape. For today's talk, we're going to walk through three steps involved in using material theming. First, Rachel is going to tell us about the design system itself and how it's expanded to include material theming. We'll go into a lot more detail than we were able to cover in the keynote there. Uh, then Rachel and I are going to walk you through a set of different uh, examples of how you can create material themes for different types of apps and different types of brands. And Josh is going to show us how to realize all of this in code. So that's the plan for today. OK, let's talk about the design system. So our updated material guidelines help you understand the foundations of good design and how to build an app with material. So materiality, if you guys remember, is still the fundamental metaphor driving the design system. These tactile surfaces still create a really predictable, usable environment for the user. Combined with things like a clear elevation model, defining surface relationships, the user intuitively understands how to use your products. Fundamental guidelines such as layout, interaction, motion, and so much more still provide the scaffolding to create these beautiful and functional products. And components are still the building blocks of great product experiences. We've expanded componentry over the years, as many of you might have noticed, um, introducing things like the bottom nav and this year uh, bot the bottom app bar, which you probably saw on stage and we'll see in our presentation. We've also strengthened the usability of many of our componentry based on user research and the material community. For example, last year we released a new text field uh, component to, to increase usability and discoverability within this component. Starting today, um, component articles in the material guidelines will feature a theming section. These sections showcase how components can be easily customized from the baseline material theme. After understanding the customization possibilities within the guidelines, you can use a very powerful tool, the Material Theme Editor, to execute. What this tool does is it cascades customization decisions throughout your design components, creating a branded symbol library within Sketch. Let's talk about a few of these customizations that really make your product come alive. In 2014, we launched a beautiful color palette and a system to think about how to apply color to your UI. But what if your brand color wasn't in this palette? How could you use the system? Today, we're introducing guidelines and tools bringing any color into the material design system. A new tool in the guidelines creates beautiful material palettes generated from any color and gives you additional options for harmonious colors to add to your palettes. You can also generate palettes in the material theme editor. The theme editor, though, takes this a step further, applying colors to the appropriate componentry across your symbol library. 
It also helps check for accessibility, using the full palette to provide alternative colors that meet accessibility standards. So let's talk about type. We introduced the same customization possibilities with typography. In 2014, we released a comprehensive Roboto type scale that mapped to component tree. Today, with the Material Theme Editor, we can create beautiful type scales for any typeface, not just Roboto. These scales are optically corrected to work in material components, mapping again across your entire symbol library. And for shape, today with the launch of the Theme Editor, we're introducing the ability to systematically customize shape so that rounder corners or a custom cut detail on some of your surfaces immediately apply across all of the surfaces within your design. And lastly, iconography. We've been building our comprehensive set of icons since 2014, resulting in a collection of over 1,000 icons. Today, we're announcing four additional sets of icons, expanding the visual range of the, vi of the original set. Available on material.io and in the theme editor, these sets allow for even more visual expression in even the smallest details of your product experience. And as you all know, design can only go so far if you can't realize it in code. So today we're launching Gallery, a collaborative tool, as Rich mentioned in, in the talk, that helps bridge this designer-developer workflow. Components exported using the theme editor can use the inspect feature in Gallery, allowing for this easy transfer of design decisions into our open source components for iOS, Android, web, and Flutter. So let's go deeper with theming. We want to show you how efficient customization can actually be. So just so you know, we test material design by creating product studies that showcase our thinking, making sure our system works for a wide variety of experiences and products and brands. You'll see these studies used throughout our updated guidelines. Today, we're going to talk about three of them. Crane, a travel app uh, here shown on desktop, Reply, an email app, um, and Shrine, a uh, retail app shown on tablet. These are, this, this visual shows how they would originally appear pre-material theming. When we pull away the content, you can see how similar the structure and the visual design uh, of these screens are. Navigation on the top, relying on color blocks to really create a differentiation from each other. But these experiences and brands are different, and that's not coming out in the user experience. Let's use material theming to better express these brands. I'm going to start with an app called Crane. Crane is a travel app uh, that helps users book and find travel, lodging, restaurant options. It's both functional, using components such as text fields, lists, selection controls to book a trip, and really editorial, using beautiful image lists to showcase and browse content. Crane's brand is refined but not unfriendly. The brand needs to give the user confidence that they can trust Crane to book travel and accept payment but also lively enough um, for vacation planning to still feel exciting. A lot of that personality starts with the color decisions. Crane's primary color is purple. It uses variants of this color to distinguish different UI elements and create contrast. And Crane's secondary color is a bright red. This red is used for important information and selection within this experience. The primary purple is the main color of the buttons, and the secondary color is really used, as I said before, for selection controls and really important typographic elements and prices. But if we use red for type and selection controls, what about error states? It's very observant, if you notice that. <laughs> Material defines a default color red, but you can define your own. So instead of red, Crane uses orange as, as its error color. So this way, the error color calls attention but isn't associated with the brand identity. Speaking of text fields, Crane uses two styles that you'll see here. This one is the lighter weight outline text field that's used for longer scrolling forms. This other text field is used for inputting search and user preferences. You can combine the two styles. They have a custom shape with rounded corners and use the brand colors, the iconography, and the typography as defined by Crane. And lastly, we mentioned Crane's emphasis on editorial content. Crane uses a masonry style grid list where photos maintain their aspect ratio so they show as much content as possible. The image list has been customized to display text labels with each item. Custom padding has been added above and below the item. OK, Josh, your designer has given you a beautiful design. Can you make it? <laughs> well, I'll see what I can do. So as a developer, I love a good challenge. And I love making beautiful designs come to life and really putting them in the hands of our users. 
our engineering team has been hard at work uh, creating building blocks for great design, complete with the kind of flexibility necessary to construct any app or any style. We've primarily done this through Material Components, or MDC, our open source libraries for UI development, available for Android, iOS, the web, and Flutter. For this particular example, I'm going to walk you through how we get started building this with MDC Web. Using material components, I can quickly drop in the basic structure of an app, a top app bar, tabs, a few text fields, and an image list. This is what it looks like before I begin customizing anything. These baseline styles will give your users a great user experience right out of the box. But today, we're talking about customizing material for your brand's specific needs. I'm going to show you how easy that is. First, color. Rachel told you about our new color system with tools and guidelines to help create a dynamic color palette using your brand colors. From those tools, you can easily pull in the colors necessary uh, into MDC Web by defining these SAS variables. These variables are used throughout the MDC components and can be used anywhere within your app to make it easy to have a, a semantic meaning and understanding to how color is applied. While all MDC components will automatically pick up and adapt those colors we just defined, you can also customize things whenever necessary. Tabs default to colors that expect they're on your default background color. However, in this app, the tabs are part of that top app bar, uh, which uses the primary color as your background. The default black that tabs use is too dark to put on top of that time primary color. So here, we show how we override the ink color on tabs with our on primary color. That's a color chosen to specifically be uh, high enough contrast to put directly on top of a primary color. And this is what that looks like. So our colors are, are, are clearly applied across the top app bar, the tabs, and the text fields. Now let's look at the image list. MDC gives us a simple standard grid very easily. Um, but for this product, we wanted that less regular masonry, masonry grid. This is how the standard grid was defined. Very easy, very simple. And here's the only changes necessary to turn it into a masonry column layout. So just a little bit, and you get that, that different layout that looks like this. And that's it. That's about 10 to 15 lines of code that went from our baseline look to this, and then a few more tweaks, and we'll have the final design. All right, what else can we build? Thank you, Josh. Um, all right, let's do another. Let's go forward to our email app, Reply. Reply's promise to users isn't especially complex. It's an email app. Um, it wants to be clearly organized. It wants to have legible typography. It wants to have straightforward navigation. But we still have customization opportunities within that. Reply's brand is focused on friendliness. It's competence and maybe, maybe even a hint of quirkiness. On mobile, Reply uses the bottom app bar. The most obvious feature that you see here is that floating action button, that golden fab in the center. And it's even been kind of nested into the, the app bar itself with that nice little cut. Doing that increases its prominence. This is a key action, as our fabs often are, and this makes it a very obvious target. Navigation is also supported in the app bar, but it's a little less obvious, less prominent. It uses the Reply logo to access a traditional navigation panel. You might also have noticed something interesting going on with the icons themselves. They're using one of those new sets that Rachel described earlier, in this case, the two-tone version. Now, these icons are still immediately recognizable. We haven't changed kind of the way that we draw the symbol, the user will still recognize it from other experiences across the system, but we have stylized it. The entry chips for the addressees in the middle of the screen here, those also use custom color and typography. And we've also adjusted some of the layout elements. So instead of the avatar being inset within the chip, as it would be for the baseline presentation, we've customized it to be a bit larger, completing the rounded shape and giving you a slightly better chance of actually being able to tell who that is. A key component of Reply's style is the way it employs, employs typographic scale. It needs to cover a lot of different 
uh, use cases or tasks related to this very text-heavy application. So we've done customization here as well. We've taken the default Roboto and replaced it with Work Sans. We've updated the weights using um, the guidance that comes out of the material theme editor to optimize how we want to size them as well. With the bold headlines and less emphasized captions and body text, we increase the scannability of the content. And you can see that really clearly in a view like the messaging list here. There's a clean visual hierarchy. The user's eye knows how to jump kind of very rhythmically down the page to catch the different titles that are there. On the cards themselves, we've customized them to use sharp corners. And we've decreased the padding between the cards so that there's just more space to get content in. Now, even though there's no indication of elevation on the cards, you can still see a clear separation between them. You're getting a little bit of that background color peeking through between the cards, cueing that these are different surfaces and that the user can reasonably expect they could, could perform swipe gestures on it, in this case, to either star or delete one of those messages. OK, that's a lot of customization. Can Josh build it? <laughs> All right. Um, so I already showed you MDC Web. So for, re for Reply, I'm going to bring you through MDC Android. One of the beauties of material components is that no matter what platform you're building for, you have a consistent set of components available, the same patterns, features, themeability, but still very much in line with the, parad the platform-specific paradigms that your users are going to expect. So here on Android, we have the same kind of material theming for color. We define our theme, inheriting from the material components theme, and define our brand colors. This defines all the colors that will flow through the app, styling both the MDC Android components, but also lower level UI elements provided by the Android framework. Now for Reply, we, we really need to exercise our ability to customize typography and use the material type scales. To do that on Android, I want to tell you about Android downloadable fonts and how with Google Fonts, you have a great set of fonts readily available to use. Work Sans is the typeface for Reply. And this is all you need to have that font downloaded on the fly whenever necessary for your app. Once we have the font, we have to apply our material type scales that the, our tooling will help you determine. Here we redefine the headline one text appearance to use Work Sans with a, a light text style. We can redefine the entire type scale and link it up to our theme so that all of the text appearances update across your app. So with those changes to our theme, we see Reply's colors and typography permeate through the components and the various views of the app. But now let's look at a couple specific components. First, chips. Chips can be tremendously versatile and useful, but also quite complicated to implement well and in a consistent way. So we've done that for you. Pull in the MDC Android chips like this. Very simple. Drop it in your layout. Getting all the nuanced behavior of a chip just right and completely pulling in your theme colors and, and type definitions. And of course, the new bottom app bar with that special little place for the floating action button. This is one of the really nice patterns that might seem like it'd take forever to figure out how to build. It did take a while, but we got that for you too. Here's the bottom app bar and floating action button where they would go in a coordinator layout, automatically pulling in your theme colors and type. It's also worth pointing out here we're using our new Material two-tone icons. These icons are available on Material.io and are ready to drop into any Android project. So that's Reply. What else? OK. Um, we'll do just one more. I, you're getting the hang of it by now, but I want to show off a couple of other aspects of the system. The final app that we're going to look at is called Shrine. So Shrine is uh, it's a retail app. It's an online marketplace that doesn't just sell goods from one label. It shows them from a variety of fashion providers and promoted labels. So because of this, a lot of the emphasis in the design of Shrine is on imagery. The tonal color palette that we use has fairly minimal contrast in this case. Okay. Those are really key choices, because think about what a user coming to this experience is looking for. They want to engage with the content. They want to be excited by the different wares that you have up for sale and keep their attention focused there. But you also need to be able to convert them. They need to be able to fly that Add to Cart button and hit it 
when it's time for them to make the purchase. So you're balancing kind of content browsing and also this more specific task execution. So with that in mind, Shrine's brand actually recedes a little bit. Content and key actions go forward. Where Shrine does assert its brand identity very strongly is in the way that it uses shape. We use sharp cuts on surfaces like the buttons and on larger sheets of, of material. Um, and those are all tied back to that diamond logo, the product logo of Shrine itself. Those aren't just aesthetic choices. When we do those surface cuts on the corner, we're also communicating how the different material surfaces are arranged in Z space and how the user might be able to interact with them in different ways. So from front to back, you have the backdrop back layer, which is where we have a custom navigation menu for Shrine. Um, in the middle, we have the backdrop front layer, which is where the bulk of the content the user is actually going to engage with is going to reside. And then the shopping cart sheet, which is actually tucked almost entirely off screen, uh, is foremost, and it just gets out of the view when it's not needed. On tablet and desktop, Shrine's primary navigation is through tabs. And in keeping with the emphasis on storytelling through shape, we're using a highlight indicator that takes a custom shape and draws it behind the active label. OK, last time, Josh, once more. OK, so this time, let's talk about iOS. Again, I'm going to show you how colors are defined very simply and easily get applied throughout all of our components. For each platform, you define these colors and then trust that we've applied them in the appropriate places across all the UI elements. But for Shrine, I really want to focus on these shape customizations. This is one of the areas I'm, I'm really excited about. It's pretty tricky to implement these things. But we aim at making adjusting shape and applying it to your components as simple as theming any other aspect of your design. Here for Shrine, we use this cut on the corners of the buttons and on the top left corner of that larger surface. On iOS, you can use our shape generators and corner APIs to style the buttons. Here you see an 8-pixel cut applied to every corner of the button. And here you see a bigger 32-pixel cut, only, but only applied to that top left corner of the card. This takes care of a ton of complexity and making touch targets behave correctly, ripples and shadows appear in the right place. And with all of this, you get, you, you get a very easy, interesting way to apply custom shapes across everything you do. Now, shape is still a work in progress. Uh, I showed it to you here applied to buttons and cards. Um, but it'll be coming to many more of our components soon. Uh, with that, hopefully I've gotten you excited about material components, um, the benefits they provide, and the ease in which they enable these very sophisticated customizations. OK. So if we revisit these three apps again, with all the customizations we just employed, they feel much more distinct. They feel much more like themselves, which is the goal. We haven't changed any of the essential structuring of the information. It's all the same content, all the same navigation, but we've added a lot more of the brand's character in through this work. And everything that you see is still entirely consistent with the fundamental principles of material design. I mean, we're not introducing anything that's going to be unfamiliar to the user. They're still going to be able to work through these systems. You know, Crane is still making use of bold color, but it's flexible enough to be able to tell a selection state from an error state, as we saw. Reply is using a different style of icons, but they're still recognizable and familiar to the user. And Shrine is still giving the user cleanly separated surfaces so they know where they can touch and how the surfaces might respond. That's the power of material theming. That's the goal we've been chasing over these last couple of years. You know, starting from the foundation of material itself, that solid material foundation of good design, and customizing the experience through key attributes which have wide-ranging impact throughout the experience. Today, we've just kind of concentrated on three of our example apps. There are actually four more at material.io. Um, so you can see a, another range of different product styles and different customization options to get the sense of the full capabilities of material theming. And while you're there, you can also see how other real brands are using material theming. So you can read about how we've applied the material theme, the Google material theme specifically, to products like Gmail, News, 
pay, and home. And over the last year, we've partnered with the stellar design teams from Genius, Lyft, NPR, Pocket Casts, and Zappos to help them bring material design into their products. You can see the studies of how these partners are thinking about material on material.io as well. This is just the start. We will be adding more new components and new material theming options, new guidance, and new examples on a regular basis. We're very excited to see what you do with material design. Thank you for joining us today. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more, <laughs> um, we have sessions coming up, about four or five different sessions that cover different aspects of material throughout the remaining couple of days of I.O. Uh, there's a session later today on stage four that goes deep on how you use material to design and build across platforms. Um, I've seen that session. It's a very good session. You will probably enjoy it as well. Uh, and we also have just outside this stage is the design and accessibility dome. We will be there throughout all of I.O. Come. I'm sure you'll have questions. We are happy to answer them there at the Dome. Uh, meet designers from the material team. You can see demos of material gallery, material theme editor. You can also get a design review for your app. Um, so you can get a 15-minute slot to talk through what questions you might have about material or design in general. And we also are going to be doing a series of short 10-ish minute talks kind of small form on different topics throughout the next couple of days of I.O. So once again, thank you, and have a good rest of I.O. Hello and welcome to I.O. Live. I'm Florina Montanescu, your host, and I'm here with Harris, Product Manager on Android Auto. Hi, Harris. Hi, Florina. So tell me, what's new for developers for Android Auto? So this is a very exciting year. Uh, we have all the new sets of the uh, changes in the APIs for media and messaging uh, developers, which is the biggest change that we made in a long while. For the media, uh, what the developers can do is they're going to be able to do content browse forward, which is pretty exciting, and they're going to have a different sets of layouts that they can use to actually present their content better to the user. For the messaging, we have uh, new messaging styles, which is going to enable them to do, uh, for example, group chat and a couple of different things. And for all the thousands of developers that we have for Android Auto, that's pretty exciting. Am I able to already download the apps directly in, in, the, in the car? Yeah, so actually what we have right now is we're also showcasing the preview of the Play Store Google Assistant uh, in the vehicles. So we've announced today that we're going to be shipping some of these Google services with Volvo, so that's pretty exciting. That's cool. Anything else that you want to tell us? No, it's like I would say it's like keep developing for Android Auto. If you're media messaging apps, we're excited to work with you. Perfect. Then check out the documentation that we have online and start developing Android apps. Thank you. Thanks. This is Florina for IO Live. Hello and welcome back to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Jorge. Jorge has been applying machine learning to diabetic retinopathy detection. Uh, hi Jorge, thanks for joining us. Hi, nice to be here. Okay, let's start with what is diabetic retinopathy? So diabetic retinopathy is the main cause of blindness among working age adults in the world. And the sad thing is that it's 90% preventable. Um, if patients would get regular eye exams and timely treatment, the problem is that people don't get regular eye exams, and so um, we've been going out and getting images of the retina in order to get a diagnosis uh, to see who is at risk for vision impairment. And how do you apply machine learning to the problem? So right now, an ophthalmologist or an eye doctor, optometrist, has to look at the image and determine what the level of retinal disease is before a patient can be referred you know, if they need referral for treatment. So with AI, you can get an immediate uh, grading of what's going on in the retina. 
So you don't have to wait sometimes an hour, two hours, or two, three days, or even weeks to get a response. You can act immediately for people that need care. And I imagine this is a scalable thing as well for areas that don't have access to the same medical help. Right, so vision impairment is expected to increase by three times by the year 2050. Wow. And so there's just not enough manpower. There's not enough eye doctors in the world to be able to take care of everyone. So this is really the only chance to be able to get the people who need care into treatment, to be able to identify them and make sure that they're able to um, get treated. What's next after this? What else do you think that you can apply machine learning to for people? Yeah, so that's really exciting. It looks like AI can see a lot of things in the retina that humans can't. So we're looking to apply it to cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, and a, a host of other problems that, that um, we're hoping, you know, that the, the algorithm can find out with just a simple retinal image. Awesome. All right, thanks for sharing your story, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. Hearing my parents playing guitar, that's probably my first memory. When I started learning about how the sound waves are just vibrations in the air, my eyes opened to like a new world. And that's, I think, when it clicked that I knew I wanted to do engineering. Daniel had a musical background. That's an important part of working on audio, is you have to have an understanding of the way sound works. The scientists at Imbari wanted to figure out a way to, in any given day, count how many blue whales there were. So the process involves recording audio from the ocean, but it's too much information for a human to try to look at and listen to. We were able to turn those sounds to spectrograms, which are just images of what sound looks like, and fed those images into TensorFlow, this machine learning tool. It allows us to take a mammoth pile of data and distill it into something meaningful. It can answer a lot of questions about the way we are affecting the marine environment and how we can help conserve it. When I was a kid, I didn't think I was going to be a scientist or an engineer. But knowing that I'll never stop learning makes me feel pretty lucky.
Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Florina Montanescu, your host, and I'm here with Harris, product manager on Android Auto. Hi, Harris. Hi, Florina. So tell me, what's new for developers for Android Auto? So this is a very exciting year. Uh, we have all the new sets of the uh, changes in the APIs for media and messaging uh, developers, which is the biggest change that we made in a long while. For the media, uh, what the developers can do is they're going to be able to do content browse forward, which is pretty exciting, and they're going to have a different sets of layouts that they can use to actually present their content better to the user. For the messaging, we have uh, new messaging styles, which is going to enable them to do, uh, for example, group chat and a couple of different things. And for all the thousands of developers that we have for Android Auto, that's pretty exciting. Am I able to already download the apps directly in, in, the, in the car? Yeah, so actually what we have right now is we're also showcasing the preview of the Play Store Google Assistant uh, in the vehicles. So we've announced today that we're going to be shipping some of these Google services with Volvo, so that's pretty exciting. That's cool. Anything else that you want to tell us? No, it's like I would say it's like keep developing for Android Auto. If you're media messaging apps, we're excited to work with you. Perfect. Then check out the documentation that we have online and start developing Android apps. Thank you. Thanks. This is Florina for IO Live. Hello and welcome back to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Jorge. Jorge has been applying machine learning to diabetic retinopathy detection. Uh, hi Jorge, thanks for joining us. Hi, nice to be here. Okay, let's start with what is diabetic retinopathy? So diabetic retinopathy is the main cause of blindness among working age adults in the world. And the sad thing is that it's 90% preventable. Um, if patients would get regular eye exams and timely treatment, the problem is that people don't get regular eye exams, and so um, we've been going out and getting images of the retina in order to get a diagnosis uh, to see who is at risk for vision impairment. And how do you apply machine learning to the problem? So right now, an ophthalmologist or an eye doctor, optometrist, has to look at the image and determine what the level of retinal disease is before a patient can be referred you know, if they need referral for treatment. So with AI, you can get an immediate uh, grading of what's going on in the retina. So you don't have to wait sometimes an hour, two hours, or two, three days, or even weeks to get a response. You can act immediately for people that need care. And I imagine this is a scalable thing as well for areas that don't have access to the same medical help. Right. So. Vision impairment is expected to increase by three times by the year 2050. Wow. And so there's just not enough manpower. There's not enough eye doctors in the world to be able to take care of everyone. So this is really the only chance to be able to get the people who need care into treatment, to be able to identify them and make sure that they're able to um, get treated. Okay. Yeah. What's next after this? What else do you think that you can apply machine learning to for people? Yeah, so that's really exciting. It looks like AI can see a lot of things in the retina that humans can't. So we're looking to apply it to cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, and a, a host of other problems that, that um, we're hoping you know, that the, the algorithm can find out with just a simple retinal image. Awesome. All right, thanks for sharing your story, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. Hearing my parents playing guitar, that's probably my first memory. When I started learning about how the sound waves are just vibrations in the air, my eyes opened to like a new world. And that's, I think, when it clicked that I knew I wanted to do engineering. Daniel had a musical background. That's an important part of working on audio, is you have to have an understanding of the way sound works. The scientists at Imbari wanted to figure out a way to, in any given day, count how many blue whales there were. So the process involves recording audio from the ocean, but it's too much information for a human to try to look at and listen to. We were able to turn those sounds to spectrograms, which are just images of what sound looks like, and fed those images into TensorFlow, this machine learning tool. It allows us to take a mammoth pile of data and distill it into something meaningful. We can answer a lot of questions about the way we are affecting the marine environment and how we can help conserve it. When I was a kid, I didn't think I was going to be a scientist or an engineer. But knowing that I'll never stop learning makes me feel pretty lucky.
Hello and welcome to IO Live. ...to the user. For the messaging, we have uh, new messaging styles, which is going to enable them to do, uh, for example, group chat and a couple of different things. And for all the thousands of developers that we have for Android Auto, that's pretty exciting. Am I able to already download the apps directly in, in, the, in the car? Yeah, so actually what we have right now is we're also showcasing the preview of the Play Store Google Assistant uh, in the vehicles. So we've announced today that we're going to be shipping some of these Google services with Volvo, so that's pretty exciting. That's cool. Anything else that you want to tell us? No, it's like I would say is like keep developing for Android Auto. If you're media messaging apps, we're excited to work with you. Perfect. Then check out the documentation that we have online and start developing Android apps. Thank you. Thanks. This is Florina for IO Live. Hello and welcome back to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Jorge. Jorge has been applying machine learning to diabetic retinopathy detection. Uh, hi Jorge, thanks for joining us. Hi, nice to be here. Okay, let's start with what is diabetic retinopathy? So diabetic retinopathy is the main cause of blindness among working age adults in the world. And the sad thing is that it's 90% preventable. Um, if patients would get regular eye exams and timely treatment, the problem is that people don't get regular eye exams, and so um, we've been going out and getting images of the retina in order to get a diagnosis uh, to see who is at risk for vision impairment. And how do you apply machine learning to the problem? So right now, an ophthalmologist or an eye doctor, optometrist, has to look at the image and determine what the level of retinal disease is before a patient can be referred you know, if they need referral for treatment. So with AI, you can get an immediate uh, grading of what's going on in the retina. So you don't have to wait sometimes an hour, two hours, or two, three days, or even weeks to get a response. You can act immediately for people that need care. And I imagine this is a scalable thing as well for areas that don't have access to the same medical help. Right. So. Vision impairment is expected to increase by three times by the year 2050. Wow. And so there's just not enough manpower. There's not enough eye doctors in the world to be able to take care of everyone. So this is really the only chance to be able to get the people who need care into treatment, to be able to identify them and make sure that they're able to um, get treated. I see. Yeah. What's next after this? What else do you think that you can apply machine learning to for people? Yeah, so that's really exciting. It looks like AI can see a lot of things in the retina that humans can't. So we're looking to apply it to cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, and a, a host of other problems that, that um, we're hoping, you know, that the, the algorithm can find out with just a simple retinal image. Awesome. All right, thanks for sharing your story, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. Hearing my parents playing guitar, that's probably my first memory. When I started learning about how the sound waves are just vibrations in the air, my eyes opened to like a new world. And that's, I think, when it clicked that I knew I wanted to do engineering. Daniel had a musical background. That's an important part of working on audio, is you have to have an understanding of the way sound works. The scientists at Ambari wanted to figure out a way to, in any given day, count how many blue whales there were. So the process involves recording audio from the ocean, but it's too much information for a human to try to look at and listen to. We were able to turn those sounds to spectrograms, which are just images of what sound looks like, and fed those images into TensorFlow, this machine learning tool. that allows us to take a mammoth pile of data and distill it into something meaningful. It can answer a lot of questions about the way we are affecting the marine environment and how we can help conserve it. When I was a kid, I didn't think I was going to be a scientist or an engineer. But knowing that I'll never stop learning makes me feel pretty lucky.
Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Florina Montanescu, your host, and I'm here with Harris, product manager on Android Auto. Hi, Harris. Hi, Florina. So tell me, what's new for developers for Android Auto? So this is a very exciting consumer payments here at Google. And with me is my partner in crime, Viruj Chitillian. All right, who's excited to hear about Google Pay today? Woo! All right. Great. So earlier this year, we unified all the ways that you can pay with Google into a single brand called Google Pay. With Google Pay, you can pay online and at millions of places all around the world with the payment information that you saved in your Google account. Today, we're going to be talking about the great ways in which we're making it easier, faster, and more rewarding for your customers to check out online and in stores. We want to make payments easy for everyone everywhere. See, Google Pay is not just an app. Google Pay makes payments a foundational and integral part of a Google user's account. So if a Google user is logged into any Google service, they can experience the amazing payment experiences that Google Pay provides. The other advantage to tying everything to one account is that payment methods and transactions can all be managed in a central location. Now, we all know that mobile is the fastest growing e-commerce surface, but your customers are transacting on all surfaces. So we want to make sure with Google Pay that, your, uh, that Google users can pay e as easily in stores with a tap as they can online at your sites and apps, as well as on Google, on Chrome, on YouTube, Google Play, and even Google Assistant. Thanks, Farooj. So what's in it for all you developers out here in the crowd? Well, currently, there are hundreds of millions of payment methods saved to Google accounts when users transact on Play or when they save their cards in Chrome. We know from operating Google Play, one of the world's largest e-commerce marketplaces, that these users that have saved payment methods to their account are much more likely to complete a transaction than when they haven't. And we call these users ready-to-pay users. Via our APIs, we're going to enable these ready-to-pay users to also check out quickly and easily in your own apps and websites, which means that you're going to see increased conversion rates, faster monetization, and you'll be able to provide your customers with the same easy, quick checkout experience that we provide on Play. Now, speaking of payment methods, let me turn to the Google Pay app. So in an upcoming update of the Google Pay app, we're going to allow you to manage all the payment methods in your Google account, not just the payment methods that you use to pay in store. And even better, we're going to provide you with a holistic view of all your transactions, whether they be on Google Apps and services, such as Play and YouTube, whether they be with third-party merchants, such as Walgreens and Uber, or whether they're transactions you've made to friends and families via our peer-to-peer -peer service. And of course, the app is available on Android, but I'm really excited to tell you all that we're bringing this capability to iOS and the web. Woo! So <laughs> let's dig a little deeper into the Google Pay app. So if you've opened the app, you come to a Home tab that uh, hopefully many of you have seen this. And this tab is personalized for you based on the credit and debit cards in your Google account, based on the loyalty programs that you have saved to Google Pay, based on the offers that you have saved to Google Pay, 
and even based on the stores that are nearby you. You can see examples of the many types of cars that you might find in the home feed of the Google Pay app. Now, what's really exciting is that some of these feed cards are actionable. So for example, this card that you see here allows you to sign up for balance rewards. Or if you already belong, it allows you to link your balance rewards count to your Google account. And this card is geo-aware. And so what that means is it only shows up when you're at Walgreens. So that's what makes the Home Tap so personalized and great. So merchants out there and providers of loyalty programs and offer programs that wish to take advantage of these features should join the ranks of the hundreds of partners that have implemented the Google Pay APIs for loyalty. And to learn more, I encourage you to go to g.co slash pay slash business. Now, we're also working with ticketing providers so that our users can easily and quickly save event tickets and boarding passes to their Google account and then be able to access them right in the Google Pay app. I'm excited to announce some of our early access partners, some which I see out here in the crowd, such as Singapore Airlines, Southwest, Eventbrite, and Fortress GB, who provides ticketing infrastructure to major soccer leagues in the UK and beyond. So to talk more about transit, I'm going to turn it to Varuj. Yeah, so loyalty and payments covers most of what's in your wallet. But transit is a massive use case for our Google users. Now, Google Pay already supports transit and has for a while at transit agencies that accept contactless debit or credit cards. So we see transactions in London, Chicago, Kiev, Sydney, Portland, and coming soon in Vancouver. But if we only support contactless debit or credit cards for transit, we'll be leaving a large portion of our Google users that use traditional transit tickets and passes underserved. And so we've been partnering with transit technology providers like NXP and ITSO to natively support these traditional tickets and passes within the Google Pay app. So you may have heard recently that we launched uh, in Las Vegas, as well as in Portland. And today, uh, we'd like to announce that coming soon, we'll have support in West Midlands in the UK. So very, very exciting. Now, we're working really hard on Google Pay. And Google Pay is already available to hundreds of millions of users in 18 markets. And I'm really proud to say that just recently, Google Pay passed 100 million downloads in the Google Play Store. Very exciting. Woo! But we're not stopping there. Very soon, we will be launching many of the core features and the Google Pay app globally. That means that billions of Google users worldwide we'll be able to leverage the amazing payment experiences that Google Pay provides. So we're very, very excited about this. Great. It is super exciting. And users in the UK and the US have one more thing to be excited about. We are bringing peer-to-peer -peer payments right into the Google Pay app. That means that you'll be able to send and request money directly from the app in the Send tab. But even more exciting than that is that you're going to be able to easily split for those, those ticket that purchase for tickets to the soccer game or the drinks at the pub easily right from the Google Pay app. So if you pull up the transaction details after paying for drinks at the pub, right from there, you'll be able to split the expense with your friends. Super exciting. Awesome. And guess what?
for many of these payment experiences, you don't even need to have the Google Pay app installed. For example, our P2P experience is already embedded in Gmail, Android Contacts, Google Assistant, Apple iMessage, and Android Messages. Last year, we announced the ability for you, through your mobile banking app, to provision a debit or credit card into Google Pay to be able to use it in stores and online. This year, we take it a step further with our banking partners. You can now sign up for a new credit or debit card in the mobile banking app, have that provision to Google Pay, and start using it even before the credit, car, uh, credit or debit card arrives in the mail. Is that awesome? That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And so now that we've taken you through this whirlwind tour of everything that's been happening since we were last up here, which has been dizzying, and it's the things that are making it easier, simpler, and more rewarding for our users to pay online and in stores, let's talk about the specific ways in which you all here can create great experiences for your customers online and in stores. So let's start with online. What I really like about online is its scale. There are millions and millions of merchants all around the world where you can buy things online. And we want to make every single one of those checkout experiences great. So that means that we need solutions that scale. And the, ideally, there are solutions where you don't have to do anything uh, or just do very little. Chrome Autofill is one of those experiences. Chrome Autofill removes the hassle from users of having to type in credit card numbers, type in shipping addresses and billing addresses. It makes it super simple. So hopefully, your site already works perfectly with Chrome Autofill. But we know that there's a number out there that don't. So we want to make sure that your users are able to take advantage of autofill as best as possible. And we've published a set of guidelines and best practices that will enable you to test and optimize your checkout forms for Chrome Autofill. To learn more, go to g.co slash pay slash autofill, or when you exit out of here, visit our sandbox right across the way and speak with our engineers about how you can optimize your checkout flow. So if we focused exclusively on autofill, we'd be doing Google users a disservice. The North Star here is really to skip the checkout form altogether. And that's where the Google Pay APIs for checkout come in. Now, we announced the online payment APIs last year. But since then, we've made three major enhancements that I'd like to talk to you about. Number one, we're announcing JavaScript bindings for the Google Pay API for checkout. That means you can provide your customers uh, with great payment experiences that Google Pay provides across all browsers. Number two. In our APIs, we use a very consistent JSON representation of the request and response object. What this means is that if you implement the Google Pay APIs for checkout, for example, uh, for web, for JavaScript, you can easily port that, including the payment processing, to your app and also to Google Assistant. I actually want to show you a, a quick a uh, demo here, not, not a demo, but uh, screens here of what we've done with Fandango that's coming soon, where you can actually get a very easy checkout experience uh, from Google Search uh, if, uh, when you use the Google Pay uh, APIs for checkout. So a user searches for tickets on Google.com, then they go to the Fandango site where they can easily uh, select and purchase tickets using Google Pay. So very exciting. And the last thing, uh, that last enhancement that I'd like to talk about is that we've enhanced our is-ready-to-pay API. 
With this API, you can tell whether a user on your site, a customer on your site, is, it has payment method that you can actually accept. And what this allows you to do is, now that I know, you know that this is a ready-to-pay user, you can really streamline the checkout experience and really drive uh, increased conversions. Great. That's Let's see pretty this cool. stuff in action. But it's even cooler when you see it in action. Let's turn to the computer, please. Great. So last year when we were up here, we showed you the great checkout experience that we created on the web, but it was limited to Chrome on Android. I'm really excited that we've now extended this to many other browsers, such as Safari, both on desktop and iOS, Firefox, and a number of browsers. And Edge and Internet Explorer are coming soon. Um, and you'll be able to play with this yourselves right after this, uh, this slide. So I'm on our demo site. Time to get some new Google gear. So I like this shell right here. So I go to the product details page, and I see that there is a buy with Google Pay button. And this is good because you may not know this, but over 60% of online purchases are really just for one item. So why put users through a multi-step checkout flow where they have to add to a cart and all these other steps? Let's just let them buy what they want right directly from product details. So when I click there, because I was already logged into my Google account, since I was maybe checking my Gmail or using YouTube, whatever other Google service, I'm automatically logged in. I see the payment methods that I've saved to my Google account and other information that's in my Google account, such as my shipping address. And then I just hit Continue, and voila, I am done. It's wow. that simple. OK, so that's cool. But on Chrome, we're doing something even more cool in the near future. So on Chrome, we are creating a near native experience that is fast and seamless and tightly integrated into Chrome. As you can see right here, when I move my window around, things stay in place. And this is really great. Let's turn it back to the slides, please. So if you want to check this out yourselves on your iPhone or on your desktop, go to g.co slash pay slash web demo. OK. So fewer distractions, faster checkout, simpler checkout means greater conversion. And we're pretty confident that you're going to see these types of results when you implement the Google Pay API. Since we announced Google Pay, the response from merchants has been overwhelming all around the world. We've added merchants such as Uber and DoorDash, ASOS, Deliveroo, and soon coming Starbucks. And our partners are seeing great results. StubHub, for example, since they've implemented the newest version of our API has seen a 7x increase in transactions through Google Pay. And Airbnb saw an 11x increase in transactions through Google Pay. And it's also interesting that Hotel Tonight, interesting and great, has found that users that use Google Pay to complete a booking are 65% more likely to complete the transaction than those who don't. So really, really great results. Super exciting. Baruch, tell us more. Yeah, so if you guys take one thing away from I.O. on the payment side, uh, you should definitely uh, figure out how you're going to implement these Google Pay APIs for checkout on your surfaces to give your customers incredible payment experiences. And we have two additional sessions that you can go to. The first is tomorrow, what's new, new for online checkout? That's on stage six. And the second is by our UX team. It's called Google Pay Best Practices for Great Payment Experiences. And that's on stage seven on Thursday. So please go out and check those out. Great. So 
Let's talk next about something that users love more than saving time, saving money. Who doesn't love to save money? So Google Pay is more than just a way to pay. We've invested heavily in making Google Pay a platform by which you can engage your users through loyalty and offers. In previous years, we've been up here and we've talked about our SmartTap protocol, which is based on NFC and allows users, when they're in store, to just tap once and convey their loyalty credentials and offers along with payment information. It's a great experience, and merchants all around the world have been implementing SmartTap and creating great value-added checkout experiences for their users. So I'm excited to announce today that Russia's Verbank is the latest partner that is going to be rolling out SmartTap across thousands of merchants in Russia. And this is super exciting. Baruch? Yeah, but we're not just stopping at loyalty and offers when it comes to SmartTap. We're working uh, with tickets as well. And in fact, we have an incredible demo today uh, that we've done with our partners at Ticketmaster that brings together all the APIs and SmartTap into one demo. So let's go to the phone. So you'll have to use your imagination here. Let's all pretend we're in Orlando. So excuse the humidity. Uh, and I'm a massive soccer fan, and my favorite team is the Chicago Fire of the MLS. So Chicago Fire is visiting uh, Orlando City F uh, SC, and I really want to check out this game with uh, Gerardo. So I'm going to open the Ticketmaster app. Now, since uh, they're my favorite team, it'll be in favorites. So now I select the game. I select the ticket. Do buy now. And here we see the buy with Google Pay button. So I'll give that a click. And I'll complete checkout. Boom. I've purchased these tickets. Gets better, though. Gets better. What's that? I said it gets better. Oh, it gets better, yeah. So now I can view these tickets. And here we see the save to phone buttons that Gerardo mentioned. So I can save this ticket to Google Pay. So now let's open the Google Pay app. When I go to the cards, I now notice that I have my tickets here for Orlando SC versus Chicago Fire, and I'm all ready to go to this game. So I'm super excited. Get your gear on. But here's a kicker, no pun intended. I can actually go to the gate to get into the game. And I don't need to fiddle around with paper tickets, and I don't need to scan QR codes. All I need to do. Let's turn it to the uh, to Elmo. Thank you. Is tap, and I've gained entry into the stadium, and I go along the way. So these are the incredible user journeys that we can uh, create together with these APIs. Back to the slides. OK, that was great. Now that we've overloaded you with information about all the great things that you can do with Google Pay, what are next steps? So the first one is super easy because it just takes a few steps. You exit out this door, and you head over to our sandbox. <laughs> and there you can meet with the engineers that have built all these amazing things. And you can get, you can get your questions answered. You can get demos. 
And some of the demos even get you cookies. And I'm not talking about browser cookies, like real tasty good cookies. Oh, man. I'm getting hungry up here. Yeah. And as we've mentioned throughout the presentation, there are several deep dives the rest of this week into the different things that we talked about today. First of all, I'd encourage you to go check out tomorrow night at 6.30 on this stage the What's New for Online Checkout session, which is going to be run by one of our PMs and one of the engineers that have built all these amazing things. Then on Thursday, our Payments UX team is going to be doing a session on best practices for creating great checkout flows. And they're going to talk, touch upon many of the things that we talked about today, but really go a lot deeper and beyond. And then finally, on Thursday afternoon, right near here, on stage five, you can learn about how you can add transactional capabilities to your actions. So if you can't make these sessions, or the sandbox, or if you're watching on live stream and you want to learn more, these are some of the resources you can go to. G.co slash pay slash autofill will give you best practices on how to optimize your site for autofill. G.co slash pay slash business will give you an overview of everything we've discussed today. And if you're a developer and you just want to jump right into the API documentation, please go to G.co slash pay slash developers uh, to get the API documentation directly. Uh, Going backwards. So, I want to make I want to say thank you to all the developers and the development com the developer community in the room. Really, these payment experiences are a partnership between us. We can't provide these pay payment experiences to your customers without you. And so, uh, thank you very much for coming today, and thank you for working with us and developing these incredible experiences together with Google Pay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, and welcome back to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'm standing here with Niall and with Jaza, and they built an app using TensorFlow. Let them talk about it a little. Niall, could you tell me what the app is and how you came up with the idea? Sure, so the app is actually a plant classification app. Um, you basically take your camera and hold it over a plant leaf. Uh, the app then tells you what type of plant it is, it tells you if it's healthy or if it has a disease, and what the disease is. Um, and we actually came up with it one day in lunch. So Shaza had been talking about wanting to create an app and we were brainstorming some ideas and I thought about my mom who has had a huge passion for gardening. Um, about a year ago we ended up moving and so she had to transport her garden from a big backyard to a tiny little patio on an apartment. Um, thus all of her plants were dying. Um, so we ended up making the app and helping her garden flourish. Awesome. Now, Shaza, what was it like getting started with machine learning? Hi, Timothy. I got started with machine learning through a TensorFlow code lab called TensorFlow for Poets, and I learned all about how machine learning works and how to um, use convolutional neural networks on your own data set using the TensorFlow API. Did you find that challenging? It was very challenging. It took me a long time to learn because it was my very first programming experience, but it ended up being a really amazing project. Awesome. Now, what's next? Do you have any ideas for new apps? Yeah, so I definitely want to do something that has to do with women in third world countries. Um, I have a really close friend who's actually a national leader in the organization Girl Up, and so their, their topic is just dealing with women in third world countries. So we're definitely working together right now on something to benefit that. Awesome. Okay, one last question. Uh, do you have any advice for somebody out there who's looking to get started in machine learning or even just computer science? To someone who's looking to get started in computer science, I would tell them that it's a lot easier than you think, and there are a ton of resources out there if you want to learn about machine learning or artificial intelligence. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. This is IO Live. Hi, and welcome to IO Live. I'm Florina Montanescu, your host, and I'm here today with Sasha Proyster, Director of Product of Android TV. Hi, Florina. 
So tell me, Sasha, what's new with Android TV? Hey, um, yeah, we have a bunch of stuff um, that we're excited to talk, uh, spe specifically with developers at uh, Google I.O., because it is a developer conference after all. So we do a lot of uh, talks and sessions here um, about how TV app developers can actually integrate really well with Android TV. So as you can see on the screen, if I just scroll around a little bit, we want, we want app developers to get their top content and like really beautiful pictures all the metadata on screen, but we want to make sure it's not only YouTube or HBO that can do that stuff, we want every app developer can do this, right? So we talk a lot about um, new ways, how you can do this integration really nice, um, what ways we have to help you with this, and basically want to enable developers to have um, really the best content on the TV and make the content really shine, because we want to help them to make their apps popular, right? And then, obviously, it's Google I.O., so we're talking about Android P as well. So um, um, we, have, uh, we have a bunch of new stuff in Android P for users, but also for developers. So some examples for users are we have a, a very new, like, fast setup flow that um, gets you all your favorite apps already uh, when you set up a device. Uh, we have features like autofill, uh, where if you have already logged in on some other device, you already get your login credentials. Um, on Android TV, so you don't have to clumsily enter passwords with the remote control. No one likes that, right? Um, and then, but also there are cool new platform APIs in, uh, in Android P where, um, uh, for example, with uh, external camera support. So you could start to develop camera apps uh, on TV as well. Um, yeah, and that's some of the stuff with Android P when, um, where um, you can use the, uh, the new Android P Preview SDK. Uh, it has a TV emulator and you can get started with that if you want. I know last year you launched the Assistant in the US, but I live in London. Can I finally use it in London also? A very good question. Actually, uh, the international support for the Google Assistant is um, roll uh, on Android TV is rolling out as we speak. So specifically, uh, the UK and some other European countries uh, rolled out in the next few weeks. Uh, but since you mentioned the Assistant, um, one really cool thing we, uh, uh, we announced here at Google I.O. is our new um, soundbar project that we did with JBL the JBL link bar that you can see here and we really like the combination of having a TV device powering your TV screen but with really awesome sound and a far-field microphone uh, built in so you don't really need this remote control anymore. You can basically just sit on the sofa and uh, control your, your TV device or any device connected uh, to the sound bar. So you can ask things like, hey Google, what's my agenda today? Today, there's only one thing on your calendar. It's at 6 p.m., and its title is Pick Up the Dog. Yeah, I really shouldn't forget that. But um, it's really nice. You don't, you don't have to get up from the couch, look for the remote control anymore. You just talk to your TV in a very natural way. Hey, Google, go home. OK, great. So I can continue losing my remote control. Thanks. <laughs> OK, but still, I'm an Android developer. So what can I do practically? Can I, is there some code that I can already write? Yeah, I mean, you, you could download the Android P Preview SDK with your emulator, but we know developers want to work with real hardware. So one really cool thing we're announcing here at Google I.O. is the ADT2 developer device. It's, uh, for those of you who have been developing for Android TV for a while, might remember we had an ADT1 developer device in 2014 launched at Google I.O. And after four years, we thought it's time to do that again. So it's a neat little Android TV dongle you can connect to your TV. Um, you can sign up for this. Um, um, we have a sign up form live and we are selecting, um, it's a limited edition device, but we make sure a lot of developers are getting one of those. It's a real cool small Android TV dongle, voice enabled remote control. So all the things we've been talking about, a content integration, assistant integration for your apps, you can try that all out on the device. Great, thank you very much, Sasha. So we already have a lot of new things for Android TV, both for developers and for end users. So now all we need to do is check out the developer documentation and also sign up for the dongle. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Um, this is Florina for IO Live. To make Android development with Kotlin more clear, pleasant, and idiomatic when working with Android framework classes, we created Android Kotlin extensions, a set of extensions to the framework that cover some of the most commonly used classes like View, Shared Preferences, Canvas, Animator, and others. For now, Android KTX is in preview, and the API is likely to change before reaching the stable version.
But here's how to integrate it in your projects to check it out. Some examples of usage and how you can contribute. In the build or gradle file of our app, add the Google repository, if it's not there already. And then add the Android KTX library to your dependencies. Let's start with a simple example. Let's say that we want to create a URI from a string. Normally, you would call URI.parse on the string. But with Android KTX, we can just call to URI on the string. When we want to save a value in share preferences, our code will look like this. We edit the preferences, put the value, and then call apply. With the extension, we just need to call edit and pass a Lambda block with the action. Under the hood, it actually does the same thing as the previous code. Working with classes from the graphics package, we've added extension functions for some of the most important classes there, canvas, bitmap, path, color, and others. So let's say that we want to draw the difference between two paths offset downward by 100 pixels. First, we get the difference of the paths. Then we translate the canvas. And afterwards, we draw the new path. All of this code can now be simplified like this. OK, let's take another example, this time with a view. And say that we want to execute uh, an action before the view is drawn. The default implementation requires us to add an on pre-draw listener, make sure it's removed before the action is triggered, and then trigger the action. With Android KTX, we can just call do on pre-draw on our view and trigger the action. These are just a few of the extensions available so far. Check out the docs to find out what else we have there. If you want to suggest more ideas for extension functions and you'd like to contribute, check out the Android KTX GitHub project. We're still in preview. The API is not stable yet, so your feedback is valuable and can shape the library. This is just the beginning of Android KTX. We're working on extensions for support library and architecture components. Kotlin on Android is here to stay, and we have big plans for it. Follow us on GitHub, YouTube, and Twitter for more news.
Hello and welcome back to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Niall and with Shaza and they built an app using TensorFlow. We're gonna talk about it a little. Niall, could you tell me what the app is and how you came up with the idea? Sure, so the app is actually a plant classification app. Um, you basically take your camera and hold it over a plant leaf. Uh, the app then tells you what type of plant it is, it tells you if it's healthy or if it has a disease and what the disease is. Um, and we actually came up with it one day in lunch. So Shaza had been talking about wanting to create an app and we were brainstorming some ideas and I thought about my mom who has had a huge passion for gardening. Um, about a year ago we ended up moving and so she had to transport her garden from a big backyard to a tiny little patio in an apartment. Um, thus all of her plants were dying. Um, so we ended up making the app and helping her garden flourish. Awesome. Now, Shaza, what was it like getting started with machine learning? Hi, Timothy. I got started with machine learning through a TensorFlow code lab called TensorFlow for Poets, and I learned all about how machine learning works and how to um, use convolutional neural networks on your own data set using the TensorFlow API. Did you find that challenging? It was very challenging. It took me a long time to learn because it was my very first programming experience, but it ended up being a really amazing project. Awesome. Now, what's next? Do you have any ideas for new apps? Yeah, so I definitely want to do something that has to do with women in third world countries. Um, I have a really close friend who's actually a national leader in the organization Girl Up, and so their, their topic is just dealing with women in third world countries. So we're definitely working together right now on something to benefit that. Awesome. Okay, one last question. Uh, do you have any advice for somebody out there who's looking to get started in machine learning or even just computer science? To someone who's looking to get started in computer science, I would tell them that it's a lot easier than you think and there are a ton of resources out there if you want to learn about machine learning or artificial intelligence. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. This is IO Live. Hi and welcome to IO Live. I'm Florina Montanescu, your host, and I'm here today with Sasha Proyster, Director of Product of Android TV. Hi Florina. So tell me Sasha, what's new with Android TV? Hey, um, yeah, we have a bunch of stuff um, that we're excited to talk uh, spe specifically with developers at uh, Google I.O. because it is a developer conference after all. So we do a lot of uh, talks and sessions here um, about how TV app developers can actually integrate really well with Android TV. So as you can see on the screen, if I just scroll around a little bit, we want, we want app developers to get their top content and like really beautiful pictures all the metadata on screen, but we want to make sure it's not only YouTube or HBO that can do that stuff, we want every app developer can do this, right? So we talk a lot about um, new ways how you can do this integration really nice, um, what ways we have to help you with this, and basically want to enable developers to have um, really the best content on the TV and make the content really shine, because we want to help them to make the apps popular, right? And then, obviously, it's Google I.O., so we're talking about Android P as well. So um, um, we, have, uh, we have a bunch of new stuff in Android P for users, but also for developers. So some examples for users are we have a, a very new, like, fast setup flow that um, gets you all your favorite apps already uh, when you set up a device. Uh, we have features like autofill, uh, where if you have already logged in on some other device, you already get your login credentials. Um, on Android TV, so you don't have to clumsily enter passwords with the remote control. No one likes that, right? Um, and then, but also there are cool new platform APIs in, uh, in Android P where, um, uh, for example, with uh, external camera support. So you could start to develop camera apps uh, on TV as well. Um, yeah, and that's some of the stuff with Android P when, um, where um, you can use the, uh, the new Android P preview SDK. Uh, it has a TV emulator and you can get started with that if you want. Oh, I know last year you launched the Assistant in the US, but I live in London. Can I finally use it in London also? A very good question. Actually, uh, the international support for the Google Assistant is um, roll uh, on Android TV is rolling out as we speak. So specifically, uh, the UK and some other European countries uh, rolled out in the next few weeks. Uh, but since you mentioned the Assistant, um, one really cool thing we, uh, uh, we announced here at Google I.O. is our new um, soundbar project that we did with JBL the JBL link bar that you can see here and we really like the combination of having a TV device powering your TV screen but with really awesome sound 
and a Farfield microphone uh, built in, so you don't really need this remote control anymore. You can basically just sit on the sofa and uh, control your, your TV device or any device connected uh, to the sound bar. So you can ask things like, hey Google, what's my agenda today? Today, there's only one thing on your calendar. It's at 6 p.m. and its title is, pick up the dog. Yeah, I really shouldn't forget that. But um, it's really nice, you don't, you don't have to get up from the couch, look for the remote control anymore, you just talk to your TV in a very natural way. Hey Google, go home. Okay, great, so I can continue losing my remote control, thanks. <laughs> okay, but still, I'm an Android developer, so what can I do practically? Can I, is there some code that I can already write? Yeah, I mean, you, you could download the Android P Preview SDK with your emulator, but we know developers want to work with real hardware. So one really cool thing we're announcing here at Google I.O. is the ADT2 developer device. It's, uh, for those of you who have been developing for Android TV for a while, might remember we had an ADT1 developer device in 2014 launched at Google I.O. And after four years, we thought it's time to do that again. So it's a neat little Android TV dongle you can connect to your TV. Um, you can sign up for this. Um, um, we have a sign-up form live, and we are selecting... Um, it's a limited edition device, but we make sure a lot of developers are getting one of those. It's a real cool, small Android TV dongle, voice-enabled remote control, so all the things we've been talking about, a content integration, assistant integration for your apps, you can try that all out on the device. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sasha. So we already have a lot of new things for Android TV, both for developers and for end users. So now all we need to do is check out the developer documentation and also sign up for the dongle. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Um, this is Florina for IO Live. To make Android development with Kotlin more clear, pleasant, and idiomatic when working with Android framework classes, we created Android Kotlin extensions, a set of extensions to the framework that cover some of the most commonly used classes like View, Shared Preferences, Canvas, Animator, and others. For now, Android KTX is in preview, and the API is likely to change before reaching the stable version. But here's how to integrate it in your projects to check it out, some examples of usage, and how you can contribute. In the build Gradle file of our app, add the Google repository, if it's not there already and then add the Android KTX library to your dependencies. Let's start with a simple example. Let's say that we want to create a URI from a string. Normally, you would call URI.parse on the string. But with Android KTX, we can just call to URI on the string. When we want to save a value in share preferences, our code will look like this. We edit the preferences, put the value, and then call apply. With the extension, we just need to call edit and pass a Lambda block with the action. Under the hood, it actually does the same thing as the previous code. Working with classes from the graphics package, we've added extension functions for some of the most important classes there, canvas, bitmap, path, color, and others. So let's say that we want to draw the difference between two paths offset downward by 100 pixels. First, we get the difference of the paths. Then we translate the canvas. And afterwards, we draw the new path. All of this code can now be simplified like this. OK, let's take another example, this time with a view. And say that we want to execute uh, an action before the view is drawn. The default implementation requires us to add an on pre-draw listener, make sure it's removed before the action is triggered, and then trigger the action. With Android KTX, we can just call do on pre-draw on our view and trigger the action. These are just a few of the extensions available so far. Check out the docs to find out what else we have there. If you want to suggest more ideas for extension functions and you'd like to contribute, check out the Android KTX GitHub project. We're still in preview. The API is not stable yet, so your feedback is valuable and can shape the library. This is just the beginning of Android KTX. We're working on extensions for support library and architecture components. Kotlin on Android is here to stay, and we have big plans for it. Follow us on GitHub, YouTube, and Twitter for more news.
Hello and welcome back to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Niall and with Jaza and they built an app using TensorFlow. We're gonna talk about it a little. Niall, could you tell me what the app is and how you came up with the idea? Sure, so the app is actually a plant classification app. Um, you basically take your camera and hold it over a plant leaf. Uh, the app then tells you what type of plant it is, it tells you if it's healthy or if it has a disease and what the disease is. Um, and we actually came up with it one day in lunch. So Shaza had been talking about wanting to create an app and we were brainstorming some ideas and I thought about my mom who has had a huge passion for gardening. Um, about a year ago we ended up moving and so she had to transport her garden from a big backyard to a tiny little patio on an apartment. Um, thus all of her plants were dying. Um, so we ended up making the app and helping her garden flourish. Awesome. Now, Shaza, what was it like getting started with machine learning? Hi, Timothy. I got started with machine learning through a TensorFlow code lab called TensorFlow for Poets, and I learned all about how machine learning works and how to um, use convolutional neural networks on your own data set using the TensorFlow API. Did you find that challenging? It was very challenging. It took me a long time to learn because it was my very first programming experience, but it ended up being a really amazing project. Awesome. Now, what's next? Do you have any ideas for new apps? Yeah, so I definitely want to do something that has to do with women in third world countries. Um, I have a really close friend who's actually a national leader in the organization Girl Up, and so their, their topic is just dealing with women in third world countries. So we're definitely working together right now on something to benefit that. Awesome. Okay, one last question. Uh, do you have any advice for somebody out there who's looking to get started in machine learning or even just computer science? To someone who's looking to get started in computer science, I would tell them that it's a lot easier than you think and there are a ton of resources out there if you want to learn about machine learning or artificial intelligence. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. This is IO Live. Hi and welcome to IO Live. I'm Florina Montanescu, your host, and I'm here today with Sasha Proyster, Director of Product of Android TV. Hi Florina. So tell me, Sasha, what's new with Android TV? Hey, um, yeah, we have a bunch of stuff um, that we're excited to talk uh, spe specifically with developers at uh, Google I.O. because it is a developer conference after all. So we do a lot of uh, talks and sessions here um, about how TV app developers can actually integrate really well with Android TV. So as you can see on the screen, if I just scroll around a little bit, we want, we want app developers to get their top content and like really beautiful pictures all the metadata on screen, but we want to make sure it's not only YouTube or HBO that can do that stuff, we want every app developer can do this, right? So we talk a lot about um, new ways how you can do this integration really nice, um, what ways we have to help you with this, and basically we want to enable developers to have um, really the best content on the TV and make the content really shine, because we want to help them to make the apps popular, right? And then, obviously, it's Google I.O., so we're talking about Android P as well. So um, um, we, have, uh, we have a bunch of new stuff in Android P for users, but also for developers. So some examples for users are we have a, a very new, like, fast setup flow that um, gets you all your favorite apps already uh, when you set up a device. Uh, we have features like autofill, uh, where if you have already logged in on some other device, you already get your login credentials. Um, on Android TV, so you don't have to clumsily enter passwords with the remote control. No one likes that, right? Um, and then, but also there are cool new platform APIs in, uh, in Android P where, um, uh, for example, with uh, external camera support. So you could start to develop camera apps uh, on TV as well. Um, yeah, and that's some of the stuff with Android P when, um, where um, you can use the, uh, the new Android P preview SDK. Uh, it has a TV emulator and you can get started with that if you want. I know last year you launched the Assistant in the US, but I live in London. Can I finally use it in London also? A very good question. Actually, uh, the international support for the Google Assistant is um, roll uh, on Android TV is rolling out as we speak. So specifically, uh, the UK and some other European countries uh, rolled out in the next few weeks. Uh, but since you mentioned the Assistant, um, one really cool thing we, uh, uh, we announced here at Google I.O. is our new um, soundbar project that we did with JBL the JBL link bar that you can see here and we really like the combination of having a TV device powering your TV screen but with really awesome sound 
and a far-field microphone uh, built in, so you don't really need this remote control anymore. You can basically just sit on the sofa and uh, control your, your TV device or any device connected uh, to the soundbar. So you can ask things like, hey Google, what's my agenda today? Today, there's only one thing on your calendar. It's at 6 p.m. and its title is, pick up the dog. Yeah, I really shouldn't forget that. But um, it's really nice, you don't, you don't have to get up from the couch, look for the remote control anymore, you just talk to your TV in a very natural way. Hey Google, go home. Okay, great, so I can continue losing my remote control, thanks. <laughs> okay, but still, I'm an Android developer, so what can I do practically? Can I, is there some code that I can already write? Yeah, I mean, you, you could download the Android P Preview SDK with your emulator, but we know developers want to work with real hardware. So one really cool thing we're announcing here at Google I.O. is the ADT2 developer device. It's, uh, for those of you who have been developing for Android TV for a while, might remember we had an ADT1 developer device in 2014 launched at Google I.O. And after four years, we thought it's time to do that again. So it's a neat little Android TV dongle you can connect to your TV. Um, you can sign up for this. Um, um, we have a sign up form live and we are selecting, um, it's a limited edition device, but we make sure a lot of developers are getting one of those. It's a real cool small Android TV dongle, voice enabled remote control, so all the things we've been talking about, a content integration, assistant integration for your apps, you can try that all out on the device. Great, thank you very much, Sasha. So we already have a lot of new things for Android TV, both for developers and for end users. So now all we need to do is check out the developer documentation and also sign up for the dongle. The introducing .app domain names uh, and how to secure them. Uh, I'm Ben McElwain. I am the lead engineer of uh, Google Registry and the co-product manager of the .app launch and we're going to be explaining a little bit later what the Google registry is exactly. Hi, I'm Adrienne Porterfelt. I'm an engineering manager and a longtime engineer on the Google Chrome team. Now, about a year ago, I think, yeah, a year ago, um, Ben came to my team and I with an idea. And now he works on the registry team. And they had an idea that they were going to be launching this TLD top level domain is what we're going to be talking about today. And the idea was to use it to make memorable and meaningful domain names. Now, I assume that all of you here like short, meaningful domain names because they tie into your brand and help users get back to them. We also like them in terms of usability of the web. We think that URLs are easier to use if the domains are something that people can actually remember and ideally differentiate between the real brands when they're trying to actually get to that website versus other content that might be spam, phishing, or spoofing. But that wasn't all. It wasn't just about coming up with meaningful and memorable domain names. Um, ben was also aware of the fact that Google, for a long time, has been pushing on HTTPS adoption. And he wanted to use this feature launch as a way to tie into that and help make the web safer. HTTPS is important because it keeps our users' content private and secure. HTTPS provides encryption between the client and the server such that anyone in the middle, like the internet service provider or someone else who's on the same wireless network, isn't able to either eavesdrop on the information while it's on transit or modify it. And pushing on HTTPS adoption has been a big effort at Google and, in fact, uh, more or less across the security community for the last several years. Back in early 2015, which is when I started working on this, um, I, we saw that only about a quarter to a third of pages loaded in Chrome were, were HTTPS. So at that point, HTTP was still dominant, and HTTPS was the exception. Well, moving forward to today, I'm really excited that we're at a point where about 75% of all page loads in Chrome are now HTTPS. So we've seen a huge shift. And now we're focusing on how do we get everything to be all HTTPS? How do we get that last little chunk? Looking back at 2014, uh, Google premiered a HTTPS ranking boost. So the idea at the time was that websites would get a bump if they supported HTTPS. Let's Encrypt, which is an awesome service that you should check out if you haven't already, they provide free HTTPS certificates, as well as tooling to make it easy to manage certificates. 
uh, launched in late 2015. And Let's Encrypt helped a lot of websites get online, particularly websites who, uh, where the developers were not able to previously afford certificates. Even though $10 and $15 sounds cheap, some people still couldn't afford it. Also in late 2015, Google started indexing HTTPS websites by default, meaning that if a website was available both over HTTP and HTTPS, we would index the HTTPS version. We also released a transparency report showing that at the time, only about a quarter of the top 100 sites supported HTTPS by default. And now it's at 83. Also, near and dear to my heart, starting in 2017, Chrome started labeling HTTP websites as not secure in the URL bar if they had a password form field or a credit card form field, because those are particularly sensitive data types. We uh, ratcheted that up a little bit. In mid-2017, we started labeling more pages as not secure if they were any HTTP page viewed in incognito or any HTTP page uh, with any kind of form field on it. And we recently announced that starting in Chrome 68, which is in July, all HTTP pages will be labeled as not secure in the URL bar. All right, so Ben was aware of this, and he was really excited about HTTPS himself, uh, as was the rest of his team. And so they wanted to bring these two things together, a product that encourages memorable domain names, as well as the security features of HTTPS. So Ben, tell them what the idea was. Yeah. All right, so uh, today we are launching the world's first entirely secure all HTTPS open top-level domain. And I know that's a little bit to unpack, so we're going to explain that. Uh, so first, uh, what's a top-level domain? Let's look at that. All right. So a top-level domain is the last part of the domain name. It's what's right of the final dot. Uh, top-level domains are run by registries, like uh, Google Registry. Uh, that's uh, my team, for instance. And that's in contrast to a domain name registrar, which is uh, where you would go to to buy domains. So a registrar will sell domains from a variety of different top-level domains, whereas the registries uh, run their own TLDs, and that TLD is only run by that registry. So you don't interact with the registries too much, but we're kind of the big database behind the scenes running the domains. Uh, so let's go through some examples of top-level domains, uh, really obvious ones, .com, .net, .org. These are the original generic TLDs, uh, and the important thing about them is they are open, so anyone can register them without restrictions, and I'm sure many people here have some of those. Uh, next up, we have uh, the sponsored TLDs. Uh, these have restrictions on uh, registration. Uh, they've also been out, these ones at least, have been out for a very long time, uh, .edu, .gov, and .mil. And for instance, uh, if you want a .mil domain, you have to be associated with the US government, so that's the restriction. And then a uh, third category would be the country code top-level domains. So some examples would be .uk, .de, and .io. And you know it's a country code top-level domain because it has two characters. So if you didn't know, .io is not a generic TLD for uh, coding, even though it, that's how it's used. It's really for the British Indian Ocean Territory. And uh, whether or not you can register a domain name on these depends uh, on the country. Some are completely open, and some have restrictions where you have to be a citizen of that country to register. And then finally, we get to the most recent ones, uh, the new generic TLDs. So here we have .how, .mina, and .google. And these started being launched in 2012 in the ICANN first expansion round of top-level domains. And there might be another one coming soon. Uh, and these three examples happen to be ones run by uh, my team, the Google Registry. And one interesting thing to note here is .mina is actually a Unicode TLD. So if you haven't seen any of these out in the wild yet, uh, just know that they're around. And these are a big mix of open, restricted, closed, and like brand TLDs, like .google is a brand TLD. So we're the only uh, people who register domain names on there. And in addition to all of these existing ones and thousands of others that already exist, Today, specifically as of 9 a.m. this morning, there is a new top-level domain on the web. And that top-level domain is .app. So yeah, today uh, we <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so we're introducing .app. Uh, .app is the new home on the web for mobile apps, web apps, progressive web apps, desktop apps, app developers, and pretty much anything else you can imagine that has anything to do with apps. 
So we envision people using it to host landing pages, server endpoints, marketing pages, uh, deep linking URLs that go directly into a specific piece of content, and pretty much anything else. And we've launched .app as an open TLD, which means that you can register it without restrictions. So anyone can buy a .app domain name and use it for any purpose. But obviously, because the string is .app, it would probably make sense to use it for something associated with .app. And you should all pay attention to the rest of this talk uh, because everyone here is getting a free .app domain name. I am. <laughs> and not just everyone in this room, but every single attendee of I.O. And you also got stickers, too. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, check your email that went out a little bit ago. It has the full, the full details on how to redeem the free .app domain. Uh, but please don't do that right now. Uh, please pay attention to the rest of the presentation. <laughs> We're going to give you some useful tips on how to use them and, most importantly, how to secure them. All right, and then this is our launch site, uh, git.app. Uh, there's useful information on there. Really, a lot of this stuff we're going to be talking about in website form. Uh, very importantly, it has the list of domain name registrars that are selling .app domain names. So this is where you would get yours uh, if you want another one or if you're on the live stream. Uh, and it also has a list of uh, some, a bunch of sites that are already live on .app domains. So .app is exciting because it brings two things together. .app provides domains that are both memorable because they're short and there are lots of names available. And also, they're all HTTPS, meaning that every website registered under .app needs to be all HTTPS. And we're going to talk about both of these properties. First, starting off with the fact that .app domains are memorable. So the main reason why I expect developers and marketers and all of you here in the room to get excited is because you can get short, memorable, doma memorable domains that tie with your brand. Since it's a new TLD, it's a fresh namespace. There are still lots of good names available, including short domain names. Although maybe not for much longer if you wait too long, because uh, just since uh, launch this morning, there's already been over 100,000 registrations, including 30,000 in just the first three minutes. Uh, yeah, my team actually snapped one up this morning. We need to figure out what we're going to put on yeah, it. My team was very hectic this morning. <laughs> So, if you can, you know, so previously, if you were trying to work in a .com world, you may have ended up with a long domain name. However, you can definitely get much shorter ones. And we think for many reasons that shorter ones are more appealing both to developers but also to end users who have to remember how to get back to your website. But not only are .app names memorable, they're also unique. And this is really important. So let's say that you, you know, you're trying to get to call this call app. Uh, this is actually a pretty popular uh, call app, um, particularly in emerging markets. And unfortunately, the thing about the name call app is that if you search in an app store for that, lots and lots of different applications use the word call. So there's a lot of ambiguity around which one maybe the user is looking for. However, domain names are unique. There's only one call.app. So domain names are just a more reliable way for people to be able to find your app, your web app, your mobile app, whatever, by name. All right. All right so uh, let's look at some real live examples of websites that are already uh, serving on that app. And uh, as we go through these, uh, I'm gonna, let's pay particular attention to the domain names that they're using and think about what alternatives might have existed on, say, their pre-existing TLDs that they could have gotten uh, if they hadn't had the .app domains. And spoiler alert, the other alternatives would not have been as good as these are. <laughs> uh, so uh, first up is cache.app, uh, obviously a great domain name. Uh, this is an app by Square, and it is for sending and receiving money. Uh, for what they're doing, you can't imagine a better domain name than cache.app. Uh, next up is the Outdoor Voices Trail Shop uh, with ov.app, a uh, nice short two-letter domain. Uh, they are a sporting apparel retailer with an augmented reality uh, shopping uh, feature in their app. And then there's Albert.app. It's a financial advice app. And you know that, that equivalent domain on .com was probably registered at least two decades ago. Who knows? But on the new namespace, you get a nice short domain name that's exactly the actual name of your app. 
and there's many, many more. Uh, we won't go through these individually, but these are all more examples of real live apps that are currently out there and running on .app domain names. And you can find this list on git.app if you're interested. Uh, but so we've talked about what's special or how the .app string itself going into the .app domain is useful, but what else is special about .app besides the name? So Adrian mentioned earlier that security was a big win for .app. Yeah, and security is personally why I'm really, really excited about it. But .app is all HTTPS by default. What this means is that, is that if you register and use a .app domain, you'll need to build an HTTPS website only from the start. I have to admit, this idea actually first came up on the Chrome security team a few years ago. And at the time, it seemed a little crazy. Like, really, could we get a whole bunch of developers to set up websites on HTTPS? But it turns out a lot has changed since then. Um, and you know, we're in the future, and the future is awesome and very friendly to HTTPS. Uh, but don't, don't just take my word for it. Uh, to quote BuzzFeed, moving to HTTPS is clearly the way forward for the industry overall. And as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, we are seeing three quarters of page loads now over HTTPS. I think most new sites, as they're coming online, are all HTTPS. Now, I'm excited about HTTPS for many reasons, but I want to tell you about why you all should be excited about HTTPS. It gives a lot of positive benefits to your website. The first is authenticity. Um, what this example is showing here on the screen is uh, someone I know named Eric Mill was browsing on a wireless hotspot. He was looking at the website for the Federal Trade Commission. Now, normally, the FTC website does not have ads all over it, sort of by nature the fact that they're a government website. But when he was looking at it, so all this area that's covered in yellow was showing advertisements. They really took up a large chunk of the viewport. And what was happening was that the wireless hotspot provider was injecting advertisements for one of their other businesses onto every HTTP website that people loaded while using the hotspot service. And this isn't a one-off. You know, this is a thing that internet service providers, wireless hotspots, et cetera, do in order to monetize. There's actually a pretty good amount of HTTP traffic that has advertisements modified, injected, et cetera. Now, I'm sure that all of you here in the room put a lot of effort into what your website looks like. You think really hard about when and how you show advertisements and how it affects your user experience. I assume you don't want someone else's ads all over your beautiful website. And HTTPS prevents that. If you have an HTTPS domain, this kind of thing can't happen. Another thing that HTTPS gives you is access to powerful APIs. New web features, ones that have come out over the last few years, are available only to HTTPS websites. This is particularly important for people who are making PWAs or progressive web apps. For example, service workers which are key for building good offline experiences, doing things like background syncing, sending push notifications, is available only to HTTPS websites. Other APIs like geolocation, camera, and mic are also HTTPS only. Also, if you have an HTTPS website, you'll get a better look in the Chrome URL bar. In July 2018, which is the Chrome 68 release, all HTTP websites will start being marked not secure, right next to the, the domain name in the URL bar. So you know, it, we're trying to tell users what you get with HTTP, which is an unencrypted, insecure connection. And if any of you here are running websites that are not HTTPS yet, please move them to HTTPS before July. Also, as an added bonus, Android security is important too. Android P requires TLS for connections between your app and backend by default to prevent anyone from messing with or looking at the traffic going between people's Android phones and your backend. So you'll need to have an HTTPS endpoint set up anyway. We're using a technique called HSTS preloading in order to ensure that dot .app sites are always all HTTPS. Um, HSTS is kind of a mouthful. HSTS stands for HTTP strict transport security. Um, earlier, I know, okay, I know that has another acronym in it. Earlier, he tried to get me to say out the full thing, and it takes like five minutes. OK, trust me. Um, so what HSTS does is it's a way for your server to tell the browser 
that your web content should be always over HTTPS. So you would send a header that's named strict transport security. And once the browser sees that header, it'll know to only connect to that domain over HTTPS from then on until the max age runs out with, without seeing an updated max age. So you'll get, even if the user doesn't specify the scheme when they type in the URL bar, or even if the user types in HTTP or clicks on an HTTP link, they'll still end up on the HTTPS version of your website. Now, HSTS also prevents something called a downgrade attack on your website. What this means is that if you have both an HTTP version and an HTTPS version, it's possible to force users back to the HTTP version if you don't have something like HSTS to make sure that they're always on the HTTPS version. So let me explain with an example. Uh, fairly recently in Mark, the Citizen Lab claims that middle boxes on Turk Telecom's network were redirecting Turkish and Syrian users to spyware when they were trying to download legitimate Windows executables. The idea here was that these download sites supported HTTPS, but weren't HTTPS only. They weren't using HSTS, which meant that the ISP was able to force those connections down to HTTP and then modify them in transit. So using HSTS will prevent that from happening. Plus, you can go one step further with something called preloading. So preloading is basically there's a long list of domains that want to be always HTTPS, even on that very first connection before the browser has had a chance to see a header. If you're on this list, then the browser knows that the connection should always be over HTTPS, even without having seen that header. All right. So in addition to preloading individual domain names uh, in the HSTS payload list, it's also pops, uh, possible to preload entire top-level domains. Uh, so that's exactly what we did, and that's how we implemented the security features of .app. Uh, so this screenshot right here is uh, just a screenshot from the actual Git repository that's hosting the HSTS preload list. And these eight TLDs are on it. And what that means is that any web request through a browser to any domain on any of these top-level domains uh, will have the URL upgraded from HTTP to HTTPS before that network connection is ever made. So it's always and only ever HTTPS to any domain on those TLDs. And we've highlighted here with the red arrow uh, .app, because that's obviously the one of important interest uh, today. But you see that there are some others. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there's a company called FTLD Registry, and they run .bank and .insurance. And those are both on this list as well. And you can pretty obviously tell why having enforced security would be important in the banking and the uh, insurance industry. Uh, so yeah, and uh, these are, there's more coming soon to this list, and we would encourage other registry operators to add even more. Uh, but uh, out of these eight that are currently on there right now, .app is the first open TLD uh, on the list. And uh, what that means is it's the first one on the list that grants security benefits to everyone here present, because you can all, and indeed you all do now have a free .app domain name. Uh, so it's, it's uh, the first time that this enhanced security benefit is being made available to everyone. And you get it just by registering a domain name. Uh, and so why is this the first? Like, why hasn't this happened before now? Uh, you know, uh, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the requisite browser support uh, for handling top-level preloading only uh, came in fairly recently. And it also hasn't been until fairly recently that really easy HTTPS uh, configuration and like one-click SSL certificate uh, provisioning uh, became, uh, came out and made it really simple to just get that HTTPS hosting working. And a lot of that, of course, is thanks to Let's Encrypt. Uh, and then also, another reason that we're doing this now is because privacy and security is on everyone's minds these days. It's in the news constantly. Uh, and uh, enforced HTTPS is something that can really help mitigate some of these issues. Because you can't have privacy and security at all if you're doing things over an insecure connection or a connection that, a connection that can force to be insecure. It's just not even possible. All right. 
And there's a huge number of different benefits of uh, preloading at the TLD level that I'd like to go over. Uh, so number one, it eliminates the hassle of configuring HSTS headers on your web server or your cloud service provider. So you'll never need to go to Stack Overflow and, or Google, like, you know, how do I get HSTS headers on Apache or Nginx or whatever? You don't even need to worry about it. Uh, that slide we showed showing the headers uh, doesn't matter. It's already done on the entire top level domain. So you get that immediately, zero configuration, just by using a .app domain name. And uh, there's no need to submit your domain to the HSTS preload list, which would otherwise be another step you would have to do to get that security benefit. Uh, and uh, very importantly, uh, by having the entire TLD already on the HSTS preload list, and we actually did this last year, it eliminates the lag time to add domains to the preload list. So if you went out like right this second and bought a .com domain name, and you wanted to adhere to the best possible web security practices, and you submitted that to the HSTS preload list right now, it would still take many months for most users to get the advantage of that higher level of security. And the reason for that is simply the browser release cycle. Uh, so it would go into the code now, then it would hit the nightly, then like a month and a half it would hit the beta, and then a month and a half it would hit the GA, and then eventually people would get around to finally upgrading their browser, and then they'd get that benefit. Uh, so you're it's already preloaded, so you don't have to wait for that long cycle. So you get the security uh, instantly. And uh, very importantly, preloading a TLD increases browser efficiency. Uh, because the preload list is built into every browser installation, like it's literally in there. It's in the downloaded executable, uh, both on desktop and mobile, uh, with e in every installation uh, even. So there's over 2 billion Chrome installations out there, and there's many billions of installations of other browsers. And the HSTS preload list is in every single one of them. So keeping the preload list small and efficient is actually very important, because it's saving a lot of disk space and memory on all these different uh, computers and mobile devices. And especially important for the mobile devices is uh, a smaller list is uh, more efficient to check against because there's fewer entries to check when you're making a web request. So it's saving CPU cycles, too. And that's obviously very important on mobile because you use more CPU cycles and you're using up more battery. And preloading makes your site faster. Uh, so if you're not preloading and you want to have security, then what you typically do is you will have an HTTP to HTTPS redirect. Uh, and so what will happen is users will just type in the domain name, and uh, by default, an HTTP request will be made, and then that will return the redirect. And now you make another request to the HTTPS site. Uh, so by not having this uh, redirect, which you can accomplish by preloading, you're saving an entire round trip to the server. And that's actually very significant on uh, mobile devices, especially on spotty cell connections. Uh, you can easily save like, at least a second on a bad connection uh, by loading the uh, secure version of the site first and immediately, rather than hitting that whole redirect. And uh, another benefit, uh, preloading makes URLs shorter without losing safety. Uh, so for marketing, you want short URLs, obviously, whether it's print materials or web ads or radio commercials or even just telling your friend the name of a domain name. You're not going to say, hey, I found this cool app. It's HTTPS colon slash slash www.nameofapp.com. No, nobody does that. So your friend is just going to type in nameofapp.com. Uh, but uh, the problem with that is now you're not getting the security unless that site is HSTS preloaded. If it's preloaded, then the request is, of course, upgraded to HTTPS without having to include the protocol specifier. So this makes both marketing people and security people happy. So a really simple example is uh, which looks better? Uh, which would you rather see on, let's say, maybe a sticker? Uh, HTTPS colon slash slash git.app or just git.app? Obviously, git.app is better. And because it's on .app, with the entire TLD being preloaded, it's just as secure as the one on the left. All right, so maybe you guys are already old hat at setting up HTTPS websites. But just in case, we're going to walk through some tips on how to set up an HTTPS website and some tools that are available for you to use. Now, of course, the first thing you need is a certificate. Um, certificate, you know, sometimes people have a perception that certificates are going to be expensive, particularly wild cards. 
Um, you can get free certificates from Let's Encrypt. Also, there are uh, cloud providers like Cloudflare or Google App Engine that will also provision a free certificate for you if you're a customer. Also, very importantly, not only does your top level domain, um, does the top level frame need to be HTTPS, but also all of the sub resources within that frame need to be HTTPS, meaning your scripts, your images, your iframes, they all need to be HTTPS as well. It's called a mixed content error if you have a mix of HTTP and HTTPS resources on a page. And this is uh, problematic for your website. If you have active resources, like a script or an iframe browsers will, uh, that are HTTP, browsers will just block them on an HTTPS connection. They won't show up. If you have passive content, like an image, it will show up, but it's still not ideal. You'll usually get a, a downgrade on the browser UI, depending on what browser you're using, uh, to, to tell people that not all of the sub-resources have been loaded correctly. So it's really important that you're testing for this, looking out for mixed content, so that you're able to move all of your sub-resources to HTTPS, too. One tool you can use is actually built into Chrome. Uh, hopefully, all of you in the room use Chrome. Uh, assuming you do, you can look in DevTools and open up the security panel. Uh, this is showing a test website, mixed.badssl.com. And it shows uh, any non-secure origins you have for sub-resource requests so that you can get them fixed. Another tool you can make use of is Lighthouse. Lighthouse provides audits. Uh, in this case, one of them is a security audit that looks for mixed content. Uh, in this example, which is, again, uh, uh, mixed.badssl.com, um, it, it tells you about all of the insecure resources that it found on the page so that you can fix them. It also highlights the one where you can very easily tell are already available over HTTPS. So for those, you'll just need to go add an extra S into the uh, resource request, and you're golden. For others, you may need to use a different subdomain. Sometimes things have a special like secure or S subdomain that they use for the HTTPS traffic. Um, or if it's a company that you uh, are, are paying, you may need to specifically specify in your contract that you want to use the HTTPS version of their site. Okay. All right, so uh, number three is use HTTPS in your development environment and indeed all environments. So don't just wait until production. Uh, there's many reasons for this. Uh, one is the powerful web APIs that Adrian was talking about. Uh, some of them you can hit insecurely over local context, but if you want to hit them over your local network and show them to your fellow developers or anything, then it simply won't work without an SSL certificate. And there's also a variety of OAuth or login flows or third-party web APIs that require HTTPS, and you can't even test or develop against them at all unless you're supporting it. Uh, so another problem is uh, if you are doing a mix of HTTP in development and then HTTPS later, you have two different canonical locations for all resources. And you can easily get those confused. You can, you know, protocol uh, relative uh, specifiers are like ugly and don't work amazingly well. It's just there's a whole class of problems you can cause for yourself that are completely unnecessary by not having that one canonical location for all resources that always starts with HTTPS. And third, it's maybe sort of tautological, but you need to use H uh, HTTPS in your dev environment so that you can test HTTPS. Uh, it doesn't make sense to wait until the very last minute right before you want to go to production and change everything and now make it secure, because a lot of things are going to start breaking right then, most likely mixed mode content errors. So you, if you're going to be running it securely in production, which you obviously should be, then you need to be testing it securely from the very beginning so problems don't creep up on you. And uh, number four, when testing, use a real domain or subdomain that you own. Or equivalently, do not use a fake domain or subdomain that you don't own. And yes, I'm, it's, just, it's the same thing repeated twice, but it's very important, so I'm emphasizing it. And the reason is simple. Why use a real domain? The issue is that if you use a fake domain, you are going to have problems. Uh, not maybe, it's almost guaranteed at some point. And the specific problem is a name collision. And a name collision is where traffic is unexpectedly going somewhere that you didn't want it to go. 
So if I use a fake domain and then I do local DNS, it'll work fine on my computer. But in any other context, like say I run a new Docker container, I forgot to set up that DNS, it's going to a completely different location. Or if I you know, give the code base to a friend and they run it, it's going to a completely different location. So you're not in charge of your own destiny when you're using a fake domain name that could route differently depending on where you're hitting it from. And this is also a huge problem if you're interacting with any third-party web services, and they are trying to make requests to those URLs. And of course, it's not working for them. Uh, and uh, huge numbers of, developer of developers worldwide have had problems when they use a fake domain or a domain on a fake TLD, only for it to turn out to be real or later become real, which is sort of even worse because things break on you later. Like when you use a fake domain, you're not in control of your own destiny. And uh, at Google Registry, we run 46 TLDs. And we know how big of a problem this is because we get an unbelievable amount of misaddressed traffic to what are supposedly fake domain names that are actually real. And to really drive that home, two of the 46 TLDs that we run are .dev and .prod. If you've been using any domain names like that, stop immediately because those are real and we're getting some of that traffic. So don't do that. I see some guilty faces. <laughs> <laughs> some, some guilty people in the audience here. All right, so here's a simple example of the right way to do things. Uh, so use a real domain name. Falcon11.app is a real domain name. And then get a wildcard certificate for all subdomains on Falcon11.app. You can do that for free with Let's Encrypt. And then uh, depending if you want just local DNS resolution, you can use good old-fashioned Etsy host file. Or if you want network level uh, resolution, you can use something like DNS mask. And the reason you would do this is you obviously don't want to route uh, traffic worldwide to your local dev setup when it's not ready. Like You don't want to leak that information. So you only want it to resolve locally. But the key thing is it's still a real domain name. So you are in charge of where that traffic will go from the world. And you know it's never going anywhere unexpectedly. So therefore, never any name collisions. And the uh, final tool uh, for doing uh, secure hosting is just use a service with automatic HTTPS. And there's so many of them these days. Uh, some examples, uh, Google App Engine, Firebase, uh, Crowdflare, GitHub Pages, uh, Netlify, and many, many more. And this is the simplest possible way to get a secure website running. Uh, for many of these, it's as simple as just hitting a single checkbox, and you get automatic security. And for some of them, it's even simpler than that, because the checkbox is checked by default. So it's zero steps to the best security. Uh, so what you get is you combine a Cloud Platform provider or hosting service that gives you automated security with a .app domain, which gives you automatic security from the domain levels. And when you have those two combined, you get the best in class, uh, best possible, best practices security. Now, some of you may be moving existing websites over to .app. If that's the case, a few things to keep in mind. Um, the first is that, assuming you want to maintain your search ranking, help out the Googlebot. Uh, Google needs to know that you're moving the domain so that you maintain your search ranking through the transition from one domain to another. Uh, there is an uh, excellent Search Console Help Center article that walks you through the uh, best practices. And there's an FAQ that covers what you need to do to prepare for a site move. So I strongly encourage you to take a look at that if you ever move a website. I'm going to pause because I see a whole bunch of people taking pictures <laughs> of the slide. <laughs> All right. Also, um, the Help Center also has a bunch of other tips on practices for making your HTTPS setting um, setup be ranking friendly. I also encourage you to check this out, too. All right, so uh, just one last final reminder. Uh, the launch site is git.app. All the relevant information is there. Or just look at what's on that sticker on the back of your laptop now, hopefully. Uh, and uh, everyone here in attendance, uh, go and get your free domain. Uh, follow the instructions in the email. Uh, for anyone who's not here, or, like on the live stream, or just people here who want more than one .app, uh, hopefully, uh, the same. And uh, the last note, and this is uh, very important, is you should go out there and use these domain names. Uh, don't just register them and park them. The security comes from using them. Uh, the security is getting more and more people on HTTPS on the web and getting more of them on the best possible practices domains that are HSTS preloaded. 
uh, and do it on that app because security is easier on that app than it is anywhere else. All right. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, here is some social information and some links to check out. Uh, the last one is uh, nomulus.foo. That's actually that shirt that you may have been wondering why I'm wearing. Uh, Nomulus is the name of our open source domain name registry platform that we use to run all 46 of our top level domains, including .app. So if you ever had any uh, curiosity about how uh, domain name or top level domains are actually run from like the perspective of inside the code base, you can go to nomulus.foo. It goes right to our GitHub, and you can see the entire source code. Uh, and we're, we're basically running out of time, so there won't be any questions. But we are going to be in the web biodome G over there. So come talk to us afterwards. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, so thank you. Depending on which ones are priorities for you, um, and we have some new business uh, stats that we're launching as well. For subscription developers, if you have a subscription model, there's now um, a more complex view uh, to understand it at a greater detail of different subscription states, subscriber states, and uh, how you benchmark retention for your app versus other apps as well. Um, you can look at new metrics like average revenue per user. Uh, you, there's new um, uh, new data about the uh, acquisition and user retention funnel there. You can also compare your stats for your app against a benchmark for peer apps that are functionally similar. So all of these things hopefully um, help developers discover opportunities that can enable them to grow and be successful on play. Awesome. So we have the app model. Tell me again the, the link. Yeah, so it's uh, the Android app bundle and you can find it at uh, g.co slash Android app bundle. Okay, perfect. Lots of new things for developers, but also for, uh, for the business side. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, and have a great I.O. This is Florina for I.O. Live. We're introducing Android Jetpack, our next generation of components and tools, along with architecture guidance designed to help you accelerate your Android development. You told us it was hard to do backwards compatibility, so we built the support library. You told us it was hard to manage your app as data changes, so we built the architecture components. And we heard you wanted more, so we're building more. Android architecture components gives us a template to write production-ready Android code, which helps us onboard new developers faster. Jetpack is made up of components in four categories, foundation, architecture, behavior, and UI. Each component is individually adoptable and built to maintain backwards compatibility. Android architecture components are very modular, so we're allowed to pick and choose what feature sets we want that are applicable to our app. Lifecycle aware observers and observable components allow for a separation of concerns that create testable, robust, high quality apps. One of the most important things that we don't have to worry about is what code goes where. So that helps us unit test the view models. It helps us build robust code. We do not have to be lifecycle aware and just helps the new devs come in and then write a proper modularized production ready code without having to add all of these extra defensive checks. It also takes advantage of Kotlin language features that make you more productive. Jetpack manages tedious activities like persistence, background tasks, navigation, and lifecycle management. So you can eliminate boilerplate code and focus on what makes your app great. Database persistence has been a nightmare for the Android community for years, and Room is a huge improvement. And Room was thought out with testability in mind, so we're able to add test covers that we weren't able to before on our persistence layer without having to build any infrastructure around that. With Android Jetpack, we're eliminating whole classes of issues and making your code easier to maintain. Since Zillow has been using Android architecture components, users have been experiencing a lot less bugs in the app. We'll keep adding new functionality to Jetpack across the entire Android surface. It's easy to get started. You can update your own app at your own speed, and all these components will work on older versions of the platform. Learn more and get started at developer.android.com slash Jetpack.
Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Florina Montanescu, your host, and I'm here with Matt Henderson from Google Play. Hello, Matt. Hi, super excited to be here. So tell me, what's new in Google Play for developers? There's tons of new stuff launching this year, uh, broadly speaking in three areas. So we've got a whole new format, a new app model uh, that's launching today. We've also got a bunch of new features that help developers to do testing and prevent bugs in their apps. Uh, and we also have some features launching today which help developers to manage their business and to grow their business on Play. Okay, this uh, new app model sounds interesting. Can I hear more about it? Yeah, so uh, there's really uh, two new different things that we're launching within the app model. So one is the Android app bundle. And that's a new format, a publishing format that a developer can use that enables them to reduce the size of their app. Uh, with the Android app bundle, makes use of a play technology, play dynamic delivery, and together it uh, serves the optimal APK for a user's uh, given device. And so it optimizes for the user's specific uh, CPU architecture of their device, it optimizes for the, uh, the screen densities, it optimizes for the, uh, the user's um, languages that they speak as well. And so by only sending the parts of the bundle that the user actually needs. It means that the APK that goes to the device is a lot smaller, and that in turn enables uh, much better install conversion rates, uh, enables a lower uninstall rates, because when the app sizes are too big, users react badly. And so that's something we're launching today that I think is gonna be a big win for developers. So what do I need to do to already use this? So uh, if you go to g.co slash Android app bundle, you can learn more. And there, uh, you can uh, learn how to get started. You can make use of the Android Studio 3.2 Canary that uh, is released today. And with that, you can um, take any app. You can uh, move it to the app bundle format. You don't need to refactor your code. Um, it's, it's very easy and straightforward. And you can learn more at that uh, g.co slash Android app bundle. Cool. And you also mentioned something about testing. Yeah, Tell me more. Yeah, so, uh, you know, as developers, you, you'll have noticed if you're during the release process, uh, it's a time of, of risk because you can have bugs going out with a new release. And uh, we have new testing track features that help to reduce that risk. And so the um, you can now use Play Publishing for uh, testing and sending out the, the APK to up to 100 internal dog food testers. Um, so that's the internal testing track. We also now have multiple testing tracks for closed betas. Um, and then uh, also to help you reduce the bugs in your apps and improve app quality, there's some new features in Android Vitals and new features in the pre-launch report. In Vitals, we have new metrics like uh, app startup time. We've also launched a new overview page in Vitals that draws uh, your attention to anomalies. If some of the vitals metrics uh, are particularly bad, then it'll highlight those to you so you know which ones to prioritize. With the pre-launch report, so that is the uh, automated crawler that tests apps prior to them going into production. And we've launched some new features today that enable you to reach further into the corners of your app that the crawler might not have otherwise reached. Um, features like a developer can, um, can do record scripts in uh, Android Studio that help the crawler to go into particular parts of the app. Uh, game developers, if, you're, if you use OpenGL, you can um, create demo loops that help the pre-launch report crawler to reach different parts of your app as well. And so all these features will mean that once your app hits production, it's been much more scrutinized, eliminating more of these bugs. Um, you know, I mentioned, mentioned as well, we've got these business features. Um, so developers are increasingly the marketers, product managers, all sorts of roles within the organization are using the Play Console, um, many of them to take advantage of these business features. And we're launching a new app dashboard in the console, which summarizes a range of different statistics. It's, I think, uh, much easier at, at, at drawing the user into um, the most important metrics. You can also configure the page now as a, depending on which ones are priorities for you. Um, and we have some new business uh, stats that we're launching as well. For subscription developers, if you have a subscription model, there's now um, a more complex view 
uh, to understand it at a greater detail of different subscription states, subscriber states, and uh, how you benchmark retention for your app versus other apps as well. Um, you can look at new metrics like average revenue per user. Uh, you, there's new, um, uh, new data about the uh, acquisition and user retention funnel there. You can also compare your stats for your app against a benchmark for peer apps that are functionally similar. So all of these things hopefully um, help developers discover opportunities that can enable them to grow and be successful on play. Awesome. So we have the app model. Tell me again the, the link. Yeah, so it's uh, the Android app bundle and you can find it at uh, g.co slash Android app bundle. Okay, perfect. Lots of new things for developers but also for, uh, for the business side. Thank you, Matt. Thanks and have a great I.O. This is Florina for I.O. Live. We're introducing Android Jetpack, our next generation of components and tools, along with architecture guidance designed to help you accelerate your Android development. You told us it was hard to do backwards compatibility, so we built the support library. You told us it was hard to manage your app as data changes, so we built the architecture components. And we heard you wanted more, so we're building more. Android architecture components gives us a template to write production-ready Android code, which helps us onboard new developers faster. Jetpack is made up of components in four categories, foundation, architecture, behavior, and UI. Each component is individually adoptable and built to maintain backwards compatibility. Android architecture components are very modular, so we're allowed to pick and choose what feature sets we want that are applicable to our app. Lifecycle-aware observers and observable components allow for a separation of concerns that create testable, robust, high-quality apps. One of the most important things that we don't have to worry about is what code goes where. So that helps us unit test the view models. It helps us build robust code. We do not have to be lifecycle aware and just helps the new devs come in and then write a proper modularized production ready code without having to add all of these extra defensive checks. It also takes advantage of Kotlin language features that make you more productive. Jetpack manages tedious activities like persistence, background tasks, navigation, and lifecycle management so you can eliminate boilerplate code and focus on what makes your app great. Database persistence has been a nightmare for the Android community for years, and Room is a huge improvement. And Room was thought out with testability in mind, so we're able to add test covers that we weren't able to before on our persistence layer without having to build any infrastructure around that. With Android Jetpack, we're eliminating whole classes of issues and making your code easier to maintain. Since Zillow has been using Android architecture components, users have been experiencing a lot less bugs in the app. We'll keep adding new functionality to Jetpack across the entire Android surface. It's easy to get started. You can update your own app at your own speed, and all these components will work on older versions of the platform. Learn more and get started at developer.android.com slash jetpack.
shotgun Everybody's talking about Good afternoon, everyone. Super excited to be here. My name is Love Kothari. I'm a product manager in Google Play Store. I'm responsible for improving our understanding of Android apps, their content, their capabilities, and their attributes. And with that understanding and knowledge, we're improving how we connect users with great digital experiences and improve their lives. Hi, everyone. My name is Ilya Furman. I'm a software engineer on the Actions on Google team. Actions on Google offers APIs for developers to integrate with the Google Assistant and other Google products. My focus is on bringing Android apps into the Actions on Google ecosystem. So today, we're super excited to give you a sneak peek into App Actions. As Dave mentioned in the keynote this morning, App Actions will allow users to discover and re-engage with the capabilities and content from your apps in just the right moment. And as an Android developer, you will get an opportunity to get surfaced across multiple Google and Android surfaces and improve engagement and reach uh, for your Android apps. Let's look at a couple of examples for this. With App Actions, users will be able to get things done quickly and seamlessly. Now imagine you're planning a Friday night out with your friends. Wouldn't it be great if you had a personal assistant which could help you accomplish tasks such as making the dinner reservation, getting movie tickets, getting a ride to the venue, and building a collage from the pictures taken during the evening. Now, Google Assistant was created to help users with these daily tasks. And for many of these tasks, the user may already have the perfect Android app on their devices. With App Actions, your Android app can integrate with Google Assistant and participate in these user journeys. Moreover, these app action suggestions will also appear on other Google and Android surfaces to help users get things done and discover what their apps can do. With app actions, users will also be able to go from the content they love to the actions they can take on that content to the relevant apps to fulfill those actions. Now imagine a Lady Gaga fan is searching for her latest hit. Wouldn't it be great if that user, while searching for that information, could also discover where to listen to her songs, watch her videos, find tickets for her upcoming concerts, and find updates about her? This is the ideal moment for the user to discover capabilities from the Android apps they already have. App Actions can help users re-engage with the apps they forgot they had, and also discover new opportunities and capabilities they did not know existed. We'll be bringing similar experiences to diverse content, such as TV shows, movies, books, courses, sports, games, books, and more. As an Android developer, you know that re-engagement is a challenging problem. Users have hundreds of apps on their devices to choose from. Android Authority did a survey a couple of years ago and found out that 77% of Android users 
do not use an app after three days of installing it. And that number goes up to 90% after a month. You all have worked really hard for those app installs, but getting users to keep coming back to your app is a harder problem. Now, notifications and emails, they're all tools in your toolkit, but it's also possible that they can come across as spammy and annoying. It's much better to re-engage with the user in the right context and in the right moment. So today, we're going beyond simply predicting the next app the user would want to open to the next app or next action user would want to take. In an AI-first world, we want to assist users to find capabilities and content from your apps, even if that information is buried deep inside the app. So how will we make this happen? First, we're building a rich catalog of actions, or intents, as we call them. Essentially, think of them as verb plus noun. These are the ways you will define what your apps are capable of. Some examples, play music, play game, take course, order ride, order food. These are all intents in our catalog. For these intents, we will then build deep semantic understanding. Now, what do I mean by that? We will define detailed schemas with parameter specs and also define grammar, not only in English, but many other languages. Now, let's take a concrete example of checking air quality in Los Angeles. There are multiple ways a user can make that query. Some examples are right here. Check pollution in LA. Find smog levels. Check air quality report. What's the forecast for air pollution? And many other possible ways a user can make that query. Google will parse all of these queries and map them into one common built-in intent called check air quality. We'll also parse the right parameters, such as location being Los Angeles and time period being today. All of this will get then passed along to the Android app, which can then take the user to the right place inside the app and fulfill that action. As I said, we'll also define grammars in popular languages and provide natural language understanding. What's really powerful about this is that you get instant global reach without actually having to do the hard work of understanding languages, providing semantic understanding. We already support 16 languages, and we'll continue to expand that coverage. How do you participate? As an Android developer, you just need to add an actions.xml file in your APK. In this file, you need to register for the intents that your app is capable of and it supports, and tell us how to fulfill those actions via deep links. And Ilya will cover more of that, exactly how you can do that. Once you have exposed the capabilities and content of your apps, Google will then map user queries and context to your app and surface you in multiple highly used Google products, starting from Android. And within Android, the launcher and smart tech selection, the Google Play Store, the Google Assistant, and the Search app. Actions are not restricted to Android P and are available on all devices with the most recent versions of these apps. Let's walk through a few examples. And by the way, I'm super excited to be walking you through this. This really amazing features we have worked really hard for the last few months to put together. This is my screen um, on my phone, the all apps and all apps screen, as you call it. Last year, we introduced the concept of predicted app row. This is the operating system trying to predict the next app me as a user would want to open up. It's been working really great. As Dave mentioned this morning, we have about 60% prediction rate on this. It's phenomenal. But this year, we want to go further. We want to go from predicting the next app to predicting the next action user would want to take. So if you take a closer look, I see two action suggestions. And right around this time of the day, I'm typically commuting back home. I'm relying on Google Maps to navigate me through the crazy, crazy Bay Area traffic we have to deal with around here. I'm also talking to my wife, Tina, catching up on our day, and mostly strategizing on how to survive with two kids at home. Uh, both of these actions take me deep inside the app to fulfill the task immediately. The actions are predicted based on my usage patterns, my routines, 
my app sequences, and also in the context I'm in, whether I'm in my car, whether I have my headset on, what else I'm doing. As another example, if I really plug in my headset in my, in my phone, I'll get an action to resume an album or a playlist that I was listening to on my, music, my favorite music app. Actions are also integrated in smart text selection in Android. So let's say I get a recommendation to a new restaurant in the city called Flower Plus Water. And as I tap around on that text, smart text selection will recognize that it's a, it's a restaurant name. It'll select the whole text. It'll also try to map what possible actions, and then further, what possible apps can fulfill that action for that given entity. So as I, as I select Flower Plus, Plus Water, I get a recommendation to use Open Table, which is an app that I use a lot to make reservations on my phone. I can tap on that. It'll take me directly into the Open Table app, where I can see, see more information, read reviews, and make that dinner reservation. All of this is getting powered using an on-device machine learning model. Any of the text that I'm selecting on the screen never leaves my device. So everything is secure and fast. Smart Text Selection's neural network will be able to recognize many other entities, such as TV shows, movies, athletes, musicians, flight numbers, and more. Actions will also surface in Play Store. Now, what's really phenomenal about this is that we all know there is an app for everything. And the Play Store is the place where users go looking for those apps and those capabilities. So let's say I search for Lady Gaga. I will get action suggestions to go inside, the, inside any of these apps and fulfill those actions. Again, what's interesting is not only I get ac action suggestions for apps I have installed, but also the apps I've not installed. This is the universe of apps that exists out there. If I tap on something that is not installed, I'll go to the details page of that app. I can then install the app. And when I tap open, it'll again take me directly into the right place inside the app to fulfill that action. With app actions, users can discover new ways to re-engage with the content they already love. Actions will also work in Assistant. So let's say I ask Assistant to show me my budget on Mint. Assistant will understand that query. It'll parse it to show budget action inside the Android app. And again, the right place inside the app will get invoked, and I'll be able to fulfill that action. Here, I'm asking Assistant, what is Lady Gaga's real name? Now, of course, we'll understand the question, answer back with the right information. But the assistant can also anticipate that I might be interested in knowing more about Lady Gaga and similar artists. So I get shown actions such as where all I can listen to her songs, watch her videos, buy tickets to her upcoming concerts, back to the example I showed early, earlier in the presentation. It's a great way for users to discover capabilities about the apps they already have, and they're able to do so in the right moment. Again, tapping on any of these chips will take me directly into your Android apps, and then will let me fulfill the action I was intended to do. Finally, as Dave mentioned this morning in the keynote, you all saw this, we are exploring different ways to surface actions in Google search for apps that users already use a lot. As an example, if you search for the latest Avengers movie, Infinity War, in addition to regular suggestions, you will now get an action to Fandango app to buy tickets, assuming Fandango is an app that I use a lot and you have it on your phone. Really cool. Changing gears a little, actions or app actions are built as part of a broader Actions in Google developer plat platform. This platform provides common development tools, processes, and a set of building blocks, foundational building blocks, really. An example of this you already saw, Intent Catalog. This is the taxonomy of some built-in intents for which we'll provide deep semantic understanding. With structured data, you can provide Google the inventory for your actions. You can also report action usage via Firebase app indexing and get recommended in personalized suggestions based on context and usage patterns. Identity and seamless digital subscriptions allow hassle-free transition across 
multiple device form, pack, form factors and modalities. The two modalities available, number one, Android app actions. That's what we've been talking about here. There is another one, which is conversational actions. And you've heard quite a bit about it in the consumer and developer keynotes. Uh, these are the ones for you to build voice-powered experiences. You can also join a vertical program and deeply integrate with Google for enhanced dis discovery across multiple Google surfaces. So Google is defining a rich catalog of intents with schemas and grammars. As a developer, you sign up by providing us an actions.xml file where you can register for intents that your app supports. You, you also tell us how to fulfill those intents via deep links. And once you have done that, you get instant increase in reach and engagement across multiple Google and Android surfaces. Ilya, can you walk us through some of this and show us how this is working? Thank you so much, Love. I hope you guys are all as excited as we are about the opportunities offered by App Actions. You must be wondering, how do I sign up? Let me walk you step by step through the process of setting up actions for your app. At the core of App Actions is actions.xml, a new configuration file that you can include in your Android APK. Actions.xml enables you to register for intents and to define fulfillment for those intents. Now, when we talk about intents in the context of actions on Google, we're talking about semantic intents. Uh, these are defined by the actions on Google platform. These intents describe what your action does in a language that Google can understand. Intents can be built in, coming from that rich catalog of intents that Love mentioned earlier, or custom intents that are defined by the developer. And while intents describe what an action does, fulfillment describes how your app does that action. For Android apps, fulfillment connects the semantic intent to the Android intent in the app. Together, intents and fulfillment define actions. And actions.xml is how you provide actions in your Android app. Once you've defined your intents and your fulfillment, you can help us personalize action suggestions by integrating usage logging into your app using APIs from Firebase app indexing. You can also extend your reach beyond Android by building conversational actions. And you can enhance the way actions are presented to the user using Slices, a new UI frame for framework for surfacing deep in-app content. This is just a quick high-level overview of the app action setup process. Let us now walk through each step in detail, starting with intents. As Love mentioned earlier, app actions is built upon a new catalog of semantic intents that are published by Google as part of the Actions on Google platform. For each intent, we define a grammar that helps us recognize user queries and parameters that we can infer from the query and pass into your app. The intent catalog helps us organize the world of actions so we can show the right actions to the right user at the right time. We expect that most developers will register for one of our built-in intents. With built-in intents, you give Google a deep understanding of what your app does. Moreover, with built-in intents, you don't need to worry about natural language understanding. I imagine after I.O., you might want to ask your assistant to get a ride to SFO, or book a taxi to San Francisco airport, or to order a cab to the San Francisco airport. With built-in intents, you don't need to worry about all the different ways in which a user can express the same intent. Google takes care of natural language understanding. Your app just needs to provide fulfillment. Built-in intents give you support for many languages right out of the box. And they provide a one-stop shop for getting access to multiple UI surfaces. We will be adding more and more intents into the catalog over time. So if your particular use case is not covered, chances are it will be soon. And you will have a way to request new intents to be defined. And if your use case is truly unique, you can define a custom intent and build your own grammar using Actions Console the equivalent of Play Console for actions on Google developers. It is important to distinguish between semantic intents that are defined by actions on Google and Android intents, a feature in the Android framework. As Android developers, you're probably familiar with Android intents. They describe specific Android operations in a way that allows Android apps to talk to each other. Semantic intents, on the other hand, are part of a larger catalog that extends beyond Android and includes the assistant, 
Google Search, and other surfaces. For Android apps, actions.xml is what defines the mapping between semantic intents and specific Android intents in your app. Of course, you can build multiple ways to fulfill the same semantic intent across different types of devices. For example, let's say you're a bank and you want to support the check account balance intent. On Android, your mobile banking app is a great way to support that intent. But separately, you could build a conversational action so you can support a voice-only experience on Google Home or Smart Displays using the tools that you've seen earlier in the actions on Google Talk. And if you'd like to learn more about how to transition from building for your Android app to building conversational experiences, you can come to a session dedicated to that on Thursday morning. Today, we will focus specifically on integrating your Android apps into the App Actions ecosystem. Now, if you're an Android developer, you're probably already familiar with intent filters, a native mechanism in Android to expose intents outside of the app. Intent filters define content types and data URIs that your app can accept. And those data URIs can come in the form of HTTP URLs or perhaps URLs in your own custom app-specific scheme. Actions.xml defines how a semantic intent inferred from a user's query or the user's context can be converted into a, a URL to open into in your app. Android's intent filter logic then converts that URL into a specific Android intent to launch in your app. Now, why do we use URLs to connect semantic intents and Android intents? Deep link URLs are part of a larger app discovery ecosystem. You can link your app URLs to your web content using verified app links or sitemaps. With Google's structured data programs, you can precisely define the specific content that your app can support. And with Firebase app indexing, you can enable Google to personalize action suggestions by, by identifying what users do when they use your app. All of these different features and programs use URLs to identify content in your app. So we've talked about intents. Now let's switch gears and talk about fulfillment. Fulfillment describes a specific mechanism to invoke a particular action in your app. Fulfillment is what tells Google how to determine the specific deep link URL to open for a given semantic intent. With actions.xml, you can use one of two models to provide fulfillment for a semantic intent. In the URL template model, we use the parameters of the semantic intent to dynamically construct a fulfillment URL at runtime. Actions.xml provides a URL template with placeholders for specific parameters. At runtime, we then take those parameters from the user intent and pass them into your URL. This model is ideal for action-centric apps with deep link APIs. In the content-driven model, we discover the fulfillment URL through your web content or your structured data. We use the user's query to find the relevant content in, in your web presence. And then we use actions.xml to connect the URL of that content with the appropriate intent. Of course, you must verify ownership of your web content before you can use it in your app. You can use Android's verified app links or connect your app with your website using the Google Search Console. All that's really needed for content-driven fulfillment is linking your actions.xml to your web pages. But the content-driven fulfillment model works best with structured data. While semantic intents describe the verbs that your app supports, structured data can describe the nouns, the inventory of your app. Google provides a variety of structured data programs. Some of them use web markup. Some of them use hosted data feeds. Many of you probably already participate in these programs. You can use our structured data developer site to see if there is a vertical program that fits your specific use case. And you can also find a link to the tool that you can use to test your markup. So how do you actually submit your actions.xml to Google? Perhaps you're developing your app in Android Studio, and you can include your actions.xml in the same Android project and the same APK that you submit to, to the Play Console. Play Console then parses your actions.xml and registers your actions in the Actions on Google database. This registration allows your app to respond to queries and appear in suggestions in various Google products. And how can you test that your actions work before you submit your app to Play? You can use our new plugin for the Android Studio called the App Actions Test Tool. 
With this tool, you can validate your actions.xml and submit it to actions on Google in the special preview mode, which makes your actions available just for your own developer account. You can then test how Google Assistant would invoke your app with different combinations of semantic intents, so semantic intent parameters. But enough talk. Let's take a look at some demos. In this first example, I will show you how the URL template-based fulfillment model works. I will show you my favorite taxi app that we built a couple of weeks ago for this session integrates with the order right built-in intent. Now, can we switch the slides for just one moment? Switch the slides. Thank you. The order right intent comes with four parameters for pickup location, drop of location, pickup time, and drop of time. Each of these parameters is defined as a schema.org entity. And you can see on the slide how we parse out the parameters of that entity from uh, a user invocation. And now let's switch to the laptop. So what you can see on your screen is Android Studio. And in my Android project, I have my actions.xml file open. You can see here that I'm registering my taxi app for the order ride intent. And I'm providing a URL template. In this case, it happens to be an HTTP URL. But you can also use in-app uh, app-specific URLs or intent URIs. And in this case, there are placeholders in the, in the URL template for two parameters, for the drop-off and pickup address. These parameters are then mapped to the parameters of the intent. The placeholders are mapped to the parameters of the intent. Now let's bring up the app actions test tool. When I click the load actions button, the tool will validate my actions at XML, parse it, and submit it to uh, actions on Google in preview mode. So I can test what would happen if I uh, pass the particular parameter. When I click Run, oops. For some reason, my phone decided to switch into landscape mode. But OK, I think, I think I made the point. Uh, the, tool passes a parameter to the, to the app. And the way this happens is the tool simulates what Google Assistant would do if it, if it received a particular semantic intent with particular parameters. Uh, more specifically, the tool constructs an action link. And you might have seen action links earlier today in the Actions on Google talk. And it, this is a deep link to a specific semantic intent in the Assistant. Let's switch to slides, please. We've talked about the, the template-based fulfillment model. Now let's talk a little bit about the, how the content-driven model works. We have worked with Coursera to integrate their app with app actions. Coursera is signing up for the take course intent from our catalog. This intent today takes a single parameter uh, of type schema.org course. And you can see how we are parsing properties of that schema.org course from a user invocation. Now, Coursera happens to annotate all of their course web pages with structured data. A and we can infer from the structured data what the name of the course is, what the course is about, and what the specific deep link URL for that course is. And since Coursera is using verified app links, we can use the same URL to open the Coursera app on the device. Let's switch to uh, the laptop, please. Thank you. Here is the actions that the, what actions that XML could look like for Coursera. Coursera is signing up for the take course intent. And for the course parameter of that intent, there is an inventory reference, an entity set reference, that ties uh, this intent registration to scheme.org course structures located on these web pages. And the URL template, in this case, just takes the URL discovered from structured data and adds a referrer param. Again, we can bring up the app actions test tool, submit actions into, in preview mode, and let's see what, what would happen if I wanted to study machine learning. It's the same thing again. 
it, the Coursera app opens to the specific deep link for the machine learning course. And if demo gods smile at us, perhaps we can also see what would happen if I try the query. What is deep learning? So here, Google is giving us a, the assistant is giving us a knowledge answer, explaining what deep learning is. But un underneath that answer, there is a suggestion to learn more by taking a course with Coursera. And when I click on that link, it opens a, sp a specific deep link to a course in the Coursera app. Let's switch back the slides, please. So you've seen how you can define your intents and fulfillment using the actions of the XML uh, configuration file. You can further help us uh, discover your apps, help users discover your apps, by, in by integrating usage login into your app using Firebase app indexing APIs. Action logging through Firebase app indexing helps Google provide personalized suggestions based on the user's context and usage patterns. For example, if you often listen to jazz music on your evening commute, we may show you a suggestion to play cool jazz radio when you get into the car. Or if we know that you keep watching Altered Carbon, we may give you a helpful suggestion when the next episode comes out. Action logging can help your app rank better in these personalized action suggestions. This is not a new API, but we have made changes to the API specifically to support app actions. You can now tie each reported event to a specific semantic intent and specific parameter values. Of course, users remain in control of their data at all times. They can see and control all of their logged activity using the My Activity website, and they can opt out of action login altogether. I will now pass the stage to Love, who will talk to you about how you can enhance your actions by adding rich UI and conversational fulfillment. Thank you, Ilya, and thank you, Demogods. This was amazing to see this in, like, happening in front of us, and it was incredible. I want to give a big shout out to multiple teams, multiple product teams that have worked together on this feature. Um, I mean, if you imagine, right, you have Android as a developer ecosystem, and you've got Actions on Google. It's never easy when you try to make both of these ecosystems work together as seamlessly as you're just seeing here. To recap. As a developer, you could participate in actions by registering your, act registering your app and the actions in your app in the actions or XML file. You can provide fulfillment with URLs, um, either the URL template or a structured data. You can report action usage using Firebase app indexing to help your app rank better. However, app actions, as we think of it, is just the first step in your journey with actions. There are more ways with which you can enhance actions and further increase engagement with users. First, you can use slices to enhance action represent representation through rich UI templates. And second, you can build conversational exp experiences and multimodality experiences for Google Assistant. Let's take a quick look. Slices enhance action pre presentation through templates. These templates are designed to appear outside the app in Android system UI like notifications, or in other Google platforms like Assistant and Search. These templates support flexible layouts, interactive controls like sliders and toggles, and dynamic data like real-time real pricing served directly from the app on the user's phone. Slices are compatible with devices uh, on API 19 or above. It essentially, it enables you to get get to about 95% of Android devices that are out there. Pretty cool. This year, Slices will launch on Google Search on Android. If you want to learn more, we have a whole session dedicated to Slices. It's tomorrow at 8.30 on stage four. Hope to see you, see you there. But what about all these new devices and platforms that are coming into market? Things that you heard from Brad in developer keynote this afternoon. You can extend your services to new devices and form factors by building conversational actions and multimodality experiences for Google Assistant. Again, to learn more, please attend our technical session on Thursday morning at 10.30 at on stage four. Actually, it's 9.30. My bad. 
So hope you are as excited about this project as we are. Many Android developers are already building support for Actions, and I hope you will as well. If you're interested, please let us know at g.co slash appactions. You can learn more about the project on that page, sign up for further updates, newsletters. We'll be starting an early access program next month. Hopefully, some of you will sign up for that. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback, and very specifically on built-in intents, that the catalog that we're building for intents. Over the next two days, we have quite a few venues to answer any burning questions that you have. We have presence in office hours. We have presence in both sandboxes uh, in Android as well as Assistant, where we can show you more of these things live and answer any questions that you have. Again, we have two more sessions, one on slices tomorrow morning and one on conversational actions on Assistant a day after tomorrow. And fairly soon, you'll be able to upload the actions.xml file with your, on your app uh, using Play, Play Developer Console. Thank you. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you have any feedback, give it, on, give it to, on this, to us on this website. Thank you so much. Thank you. The sun comes out, and it's a new day. Code editor pin. And down here is the JavaScript debugging pane, which you'll learn more about shortly. Note that when your DevTools window is wide, the JavaScript debugging pane moves to the right. If you take a step back and think about how the app works, it's probably safe to guess that the incorrect sum gets computed in the click event listener that's associated to the button. Therefore, you want to pause the code right when the event listener executes. Event listener breakpoints let you do exactly that. Expand the event listener breakpoints section, then expand the mouse category, then check the click checkbox. DevTools now pauses on the first line of any click event listener that executes. Back in the demo, click the button again, and DevTools pauses on the first line of this onClick function. The blue highlight indicates what line of code you're currently paused on. If you're paused on a different line of code, press Resume Script Execution until you're paused on the correct line. You paused on the wrong line because you have a Chrome extension which registers click event listeners on every page that you visit. If you try the workflow I'm describing in an incognito window, you can see that you always pause on the correct line of code. Event listener breakpoints are just one type of breakpoint. DevTools offers many other types. For example, you can set a breakpoint on a specific line of code, or when a DOM node changes, or when an exception gets thrown, and so on. After this tutorial, I recommend checking out our breakpoints guide, which teaches you when and how to use each type. The link to that guide is in the description too. I'm paused in the click listener, and now I want to execute the code one line at a time. The code stepping controls right here let you do that. Click the step into next function call button to investigate a function further. For example, when I step into the inputs are empty function, it jumps me to the first line of that function. When I'm confident that a function is working as expected, I can click the step over next function call button. The function executes, but I don't walk through it line by line. For example, if I click the step into next function call, this line here would be highlighted blue meaning this is where I'm currently paused. But when I click step over next function call, the function executes to completion, and I pause on the next line of the function that I'm currently stepping through. Last, suppose I'm stepping through a function and I realize it's not relevant to my bug. In that case, I can press step out of current function and DevTools executes the rest of the function. If this doesn't make complete sense right now, I recommend creating a snippet, which is a little block of JavaScript code that you can execute at any time. Set a breakpoint in your snippet and play around with the code stepping controls yourself in order to understand how they all work. Back in the script, I can tell that the bug is probably somewhere in the update label function. Rather than stepping through a bunch of irrelevant code, I can set a line of code breakpoint right around where the bug probably occurs. To do that, I just click the line number next to the code. This blue icon indicates that there's a breakpoint on this line. When I press Resume Script Execution, DevTools runs all the code up until that line and then pauses before that line executes. Over here in the JavaScript debugging pane, I can see the call stack that caused this code to execute. I can click on the functions to see where each one got called. 
The scope section shows me all of the local and global variables that are currently defined at this moment in time. I can click on values to edit them, but I'm not gonna do that right now. However, when I look at these values, they look suspicious. They're wrapped in double quotes, which means that they're strings. This could be the cause of the bug. I'm going to investigate this further over in the watch expression section. Here I can watch the values of variables over time. You can store any valid JavaScript expression here. For example, I click add expression, then type type of sum, then press enter, and I can now see the value of that expression. As I suspected, sum is a string when it should be an integer. Now I'm going to open up the console to test out a potential fix for the bug. When I'm paused on a line of code, the console has access to all the variables that are currently in scope. For example, when I evaluate addend1, it returns 5. I think I can fix this bug by converting the addend1 and addend2 variables to integers before adding them. So let me try that now. Yep, that fixes it. I can verify that this change fixes the bug by editing the code directly from DevTools. First, I'll resume script execution, then make my change. To save the change, I press Command S on Mac or Control S on Windows and Linux. Then I click Deactivate Breakpoints so that I can test out the app without triggering the breakpoints I've set. Now the app sums up numbers as expected. All right, you now have an excellent foundation in how to effectively debug JavaScript using DevTools. From here, I recommend learning about all of the breakpoints that DevTools has to offer, as I mentioned before. We also have a JavaScript debugging reference where you can learn about literally every feature related to debugging in DevTools. Links to both are in the description. Thanks for watching and happy bug hunting.
Hello from IO Live. I'm Serena Montanescu and I'm here with Ankit, the product manager at Google Pay. Hi, Ankit. Hi. Thank so, you for having me. <laughs> so, uh, what's Google Pay? So Google Pay is our uh, payment solution for both online and in store. Uh, we enable uh, Google has hundreds of millions of credit cards on file from Chrome when users autofill in Chrome through Google Pay, when users pay on the Google Store, YouTube Play. Uh, we're bringing the power of all of those cards that we have to stores, both in physical stores and in online stores. Okay, so how about merchants that have an omni-channel? Yeah, so we enable a variety of experiences. So online, for example, we allow you to have a Google Pay button uh, that enables a one-click checkout with any of these credit cards on file. In store, we allow you to accept payments through NFC. We have a set of loyalty solutions so we can help you enroll users in your loyalty program, make sure loyalty is conveyed at the point of checkout. And then today we're also announcing like a good mobile wallet. We're supporting other items that users have in their wallet. So boarding passes, event tickets, um, offers, uh, that sort of thing. If you are an omni-channel merchant, we're happy to work with you. We enable it. One of the demos that we have today showcases this very well. Uh, we have an experience that we've built with Oak Labs and Dot Dash Pay. It's a smart mirror. You walk into the dressing room with your items. The mirrors will detect it. We then enable a one-tap checkout with your phone. Uh, your loyalty is conveyed, as is your payment credential. And then after that, you're rewarded with an online offer that you can then use in uh, on their online stores. And so this is an example of how we can bring users back to the merchant after having an in-store experience. Okay, sounds great. I'm a developer, so how do I get started with it? Yeah, we provide a suite of APIs. Um, it's with just a few lines of code. Uh, we enable you to add a buy with uh, buy with Google Pay button or a Google Pay button for your website. We also have APIs that allow you to uh, accept loyalty or allow you to help get users enrolled in your loyalty program and you can learn about those at pay.google.com. Okay, so check out pay.google.com and get started with Google Pay. Thank you, Ankit. Thank you. I'm Florina from IO Live. Hey everyone, we're now at the Web Sandbox and we're going to talk to Paul about Lighthouse. Now, you may remember Lighthouse gives you actionable advice for improving your websites. Paul, come on over here and show us what this is all about. How are you doing? Um, yeah, so this is our Lighthouse, real world Lighthouse that we've got as well. So Lighthouse is our tool that helps developers actually fix the problems on their sites. So we open up Chrome, run DevTools, uh, and then we just inspect a whole bunch of the kind of the, the tools that we've got uh, or the problems on the page and give developers actionable advice. Um, but the problem that we've got is that we've got a lot of different tools. So this is our actual central place to try and unify Google's uh, performance, informational, architectural tool in story as well. So should we give it a demo? Yeah, let's do that. All right, cool. So here we go. I'll, uh, I'll use my site because it's probably the best and I, I like people to go to my site. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what happens, we're going to enter the URL. Uh, and so basically developers at the event are going to be able to come up, uh, put their URL in, and then get uh, actual real-world feedback about how to improve their site. Um, so we press go, and it goes off. Uh, it runs Lighthouse, it runs PageSpeed, uh, page uh, and also web page test. And we've also got a number of other different tools as well, which we're not kind of automating today because it's a little bit too much. Um, but we want to give developers an idea of what's happening. Uh, so the first one's already come through, the PageSpeed Insight score. So the uh, general mobileness is good. Uh, I'm 99 out of 100. And then the Lighthouse scores have also come through as well. So I'm doing well in performance, progressive web happiness. I'm not doing very well in accessibility. I need to fix that. And my SEO is pretty poor as well. Uh, and then if you want a little bit more detail, we've got the view report button as well, which will give you a full detailed report that you can, you can go and send back to your manager and tell them like, <laughs> you know, everyone's just seen how poor our site is. Let's go and fix it or how good it is actually. Uh, and give me a raise. So. Yeah, that's our Lighthouse, uh, our page speed. Uh, we've got a num numerous range of different tools, and like this whole area is about trying to show you kind of what goes where and how to use it and when. This is awesome, Paul. And I have to admit, I was kind of expecting the hundreds across the board. Yeah, I know Dion said the same as well, and he's going to have words with me later on. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing this. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, if you want to see more videos just like this, remember to head on over to g.co slash io slash guide. I'm Timothy Jordan. I'll see you in the next one. If you're still using console.log to find and fix JavaScript issues, you might be spending more time debugging than you need to. 
This tutorial shows you how to make the most of Chrome DevTools so that you can debug your JavaScript as quickly as possible. I'm gonna use this buggy demo here to demonstrate all of the debugging tools in DevTools. I recommend that you open up this demo yourself and follow along with each step. The link is in the description. Whatever issue you're debugging, you always wanna start by reproducing the issue. You wanna find a series of actions that consistently reproduces the bug. In this demo, when I add five and one, the result down here at the bottom is 51. Obviously that should be six. This is the bug that I need to track down. At this point, you might be tempted to use console.log to infer where the code is going wrong. Sure, it may get the job done, but it's rather inefficient. First, you have to find the relevant code, which could take a while on a big code base. Then you have to sprinkle console.log statements throughout the code. Then you gotta reload the page and look at the logs, but maybe the logs didn't give you all the information you need, so you gotta go back and add more logs, and so on. With DevTools, you can pause the code in the middle of its execution, inspect the variables that are in scope at that moment in time, and walk through your code one line at a time. Open DevTools by pressing Command Option J on Mac or Control Shift J on Windows and Linux. Then click the Sources tab. The Sources panel is where you debug JavaScript. It has three main parts. At the top left here is the File Navigator pane where you can inspect the files that the page uses. After clicking on a file, you can see the contents of it here in the Code Editor pane. And down here is the JavaScript debugging pane, which you'll learn more about shortly. Note that when your DevTools window is wide, the JavaScript debugging pane moves to the right. If you take a step back and think about how the app works, it's probably safe to guess that the incorrect sum gets computed in the click event listener that's associated to the button. Therefore, you want to pause the code right when the event listener executes. Event listener breakpoints let you do exactly that. Expand the event listener breakpoints section, then expand the mouse category, then check the click checkbox. DevTools now pauses on the first line of any click event listener that executes. Back in the demo, click the button again, and DevTools pauses on the first line of this onClick function. The blue highlight indicates what line of code you're currently paused on. If you're paused on a different line of code, press resume script execution until you're paused on the correct line. You paused on the wrong line because you have a Chrome extension which registers click event listeners on every page that you visit. If you try the workflow I'm describing in an incognito window, you can see that you always pause on the correct line of code. Event listener breakpoints are just one type of breakpoint. DevTools offers many other types. For example, you can set a breakpoint on a specific line of code, or when a DOM node changes, or when an exception gets thrown, and so on. After this tutorial, I recommend checking out our breakpoints guide, which teaches you when and how to use each type. The link to that guide is in the description too. I'm paused in the click listener, and now I want to execute the code one line at a time. The code stepping controls right here let you do that. Click the step into next function call button to investigate a function further. For example, when I step into the inputs are empty function, it jumps me to the first line of that function. When I'm confident that a function is working as expected, I can click the step over next function call button. The function executes, but I don't walk through it line by line. For example, if I click step into next function call, this line here would be highlighted blue, meaning this is where I'm currently paused. But when I click step over next function call, the function executes to completion and I pause on the next line of the function that I'm currently stepping through. Last, suppose I'm stepping through a function and I realize it's not relevant to my bug. In that case, I can press step out of current function and DevTools executes the rest of the function. If this doesn't make complete sense right now, I recommend creating a snippet, which is a little block of JavaScript code that you can execute at any time. Set a breakpoint in your snippet and play around with the code stepping controls yourself in order to understand how they all work. Back in the script, I can tell that the bug is probably somewhere in the update label function. Rather than stepping through a bunch of irrelevant code, I can set a line of code breakpoint right around where the bug probably occurs. To do that, I just click the line number next to the code. This blue icon indicates that there's a breakpoint on this line. When I press resume script execution, DevTools runs all the code up until that line and then pauses before that line executes. Over here in the JavaScript debugging pane, I can see the call stack that caused this code to execute. 
I can click on the functions to see where each one got called. The scope section shows me all of the local and global variables that are currently defined at this moment in time. I can click on values to edit them, but I'm not going to do that right now. However, when I look at these values, they look suspicious. They're wrapped in double quotes, which means that they're strings. This could be the cause of the bug. I'm going to investigate this further over in the watch expression section. Here I can watch the values of variables over time. You can store any valid JavaScript expression here. For example, I click add expression, then type type of sum, then press enter, and I can now see the value of that expression. As I suspected, sum is a string when it should be an integer. Now I'm going to open up the console to test out a potential fix for the bug. When I'm paused on a line of code, the console has access to all the variables that are currently in scope. For example, when I evaluate addend1, it returns 5. I think I can fix this bug by converting the addend1 and addend2 variables to integers before adding them. So let me try that now. Yep, that fixes it. I can verify that this change fixes the bug by editing the code directly from DevTools. First, I'll resume script execution, then make my change. To save the change, I press Command S on Mac or Control S on Windows and Linux. Then I click Deactivate Breakpoints so that I can test out the app without triggering the breakpoints I've set. Now the app sums up numbers as expected. All right, you now have an excellent foundation in how to effectively debug JavaScript using DevTools. From here, I recommend learning about all of the breakpoints that DevTools has to offer, as I mentioned before. We also have a JavaScript debugging reference where you can learn about literally every feature related to debugging in DevTools. Links to both are in the description. Thanks for watching and happy bug hunting.
Okay. Hi. All right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Wow, it's a nice stage. Okay. Well, I am delighted to be here. I have a clock. We're going to get to see Hannah Beachler after me, so that's going to be super awesome. Uh, I am the warm-up act. I'm John Maida. Good to see all of you. Uh, this is something I made three years ago. Does anyone know this TV show? No, I don't know this TV show. Well, uh, I spoke at the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, and it was a true honor. Um, but I didn't really didn't think about Star Trek a lot until that moment. And I made this image, and I showed it. And people were asking me, why, why am I Scotty? And I was like, well, Scotty is an engineer, and I wanted to be an engineer. And I was asked, well, why not Sulu? Because he's Asian. And I said, no, I don't want to be Sulu. I want to be Scotty. I want to be an engineer. But it was in that moment I realized the reason why I didn't want to be Sulu is because I thought he was weird. In the sense that I thought it was strange how Sulu didn't speak with some kind of thick Asian accent on TV. And I thought, that's, that's weird. Something's wrong with him. And it always stuck with me. Why did I think it was wrong that he sounded like a Californian? I never thought of it until that moment. And that's a general topic of this presentation. Now, if you have a question uh, and you got introvert, just text me your question, 253-217-4017, uh, and we'll be able to interact. Because the problem with this kind of conversation thing is it isn't a conversation. It's like a one-way thing. So go ahead and text me a question at 253-217-4017, and I'm watching the clock. OK, here we go. OK, the Zion Tech reports, uh, there's four of them now. They're long. So you can read them in the microtype, et cetera. Uh, the big conclusion after four years of work has been to ask questions about how can design and tech be more inclusive. If we can figure this out, we can unlock incredible possibility and profitability. The problem with the word design, however, is that it means too many things. So the report defines design as three kinds of design. There's classical design, like your glasses. There's design thinking, this idea of using post-it notes to create structure of ideas. And there's computational design, the kind of design that is powered by Moore's law. It's a different kind of design. It uses a material that didn't exist 100 years ago. What's a computational designer? I've defined this as roughly four type of things you have to have as a computational designer. You don't have to know how to program, but you have to be technically literate. Uh, you also have to think critically about technology. For you, technology is a responsibility. So you wonder how things are being used. You also use all kinds of design. You aren't stuck in just computational design. And lastly, you're very curious about new things, because designers love to th learn new people, new customs, new anything, because it's how they learn. So designers are inherently diversity positive. It's a very important point. Now, if you think about the value of design, it's been demonstrated by all the M&A activity, the mergers and acquisition activity uh, of agencies. So uh, I reported on this report, uh, over 20 agencies were acquired by consulting companies, because consulting companies are finding value in design for their clients, which is a big deal. Never happened before. Now, the problem, however, uh, is that classical designers tend to dis design thinking. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, design thinkers, they have the post it notes and the Sharpie markers with a whiteboard. You know, classical designers don't think of them as real designers. But I always tell classical designers, well, they make more money than you do. So, important to note design thinking is not a bad thing, it's a different kind of design. Also, I found that being in Silicon Valley for a while, we tend to forget there's the rest of the world. So I'm a big fan of China and all the design work being done there, uh, design of cars, design of experiences, especially mobile, and more recently, using AI to design banners, designs. They're just so further ahead that many people seem to uh, have the impression in the United States. And that's uh, kind of an embarrassing problem. Also, the other problem I've seen in tech is that it indexes to younger people. 
uh, which is a great opportunity. But there's also an incredible opportunity uh, in the older generation. Because uh, I don't know if you all know this, but you all will get older. Yeah, it's not a problem. It's a real thing. And as you get older, things change. The first thing that changes is your eyesight. So for all designers who love 6.5 point, better give it up. Looks awesome, especially in light. But you won't be able to see it once you hit 40-something. And at Automatic, we call this the bolder generation. Get it? Bolder? We like that. OK. Um, good news is that design is being used sooner in the process. It used to be in tech that you'd make the technology, and oh my gosh, it finally works. And you'd spray design on, called Make It Pretty. Um, that was great 10 years ago, but because the competition is so fierce now, you have to bake design into the product. And you can see globally, uh, we did a survey of 2,000 people, um, the, the trend is design is being used early in the process, which is a big deal. Now, when we talk about computational design, however, it's important to note that computational design uses the computer. And uh, if you were, who was there in the 80s? 80s? 80s, come on, 80s people, right? People didn't like people who used the computer for design, right? You're made fun of, like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You were a bad designer because you were using the computer. There was a time. Um, uh, but the computer kept on getting more interesting. It came out of print. It became interactive. Who remembers Macromedia Director? Macromind, come on. Yes, yes. Uh, this stuff has been happening for a long time, interaction design. Uh, more recently, I have these tools gotten more interesting, uh, specifically by integrating things like machine intelligence. That's, we can all feel it coming. And that's kind of exciting, but also scary at the same time. Let's see here. OK. So when we think about machine intelligence, my favorite demo, and this is all sourcing real data off the internet, uh, this is Siri saying something in iOS 9. One liter is 33.81 fluid ounces. This is iOS 10. One liter is 33.81 fluid ounces. This is iOS 11. One liter is 33.81 fluid ounces. Got really good fast, didn't it? That's what's happening. These quantum leaps are occurring. Linearity is being thrown out, and that's really important. And so when people ask in design, should I learn all these things? If you don't learn them, you'll be left behind. And so it's so key to stay at the forefront. Now, uh, I also had this question. Uh, when do you expect AI to replace most visual designers? And it's interesting because the average says at least five years till visual designers get replaced. Uh, not everyone, of course, but some design jobs. Uh, I think it's going to be much sooner, uh, quite frankly, uh, because all the information from companies like Google and companies in China as well are that a lot of rote things can be done by machine intelligence. Here are some of my favorites. Uh, I love that you can remove the watermark. I wonder why you'd want to do that. Um, you can perfect contrast. This is MIT work. A you know, dark image, awesome image. You can also take two photos and make a new photo out of them, too. This is work from NVIDIA. You can also generate infinite variations of ideas uh, just with pattern libraries in machine intelligence. You can also, as you all know, in this audience at least, you can change people's faces. And you can fix drawings. What's important to note, though, is that we see these warnings. Consider the photos. That's how you tell if it's fake. But it's so hard to tell if things are fake these days. As soon as it's going to get harder and harder. Um, so we are human beings. We like to mess with the machine. So this is one of my favorite things. If you click on this button, uh, this will like randomly hit things so your browser gets confused. So we humans love to confuse machine intelligence. You know, put a pixel there. I don't know where it is anymore, says machine intelligence. So we'll keep looking for this to try to stop the inevitable, which is that computers are learning so quickly. And when they learn so quickly, they learn bad things. I'm not sure if you remember it, but in July 2015, the Wall Street Journal reported how images, uh, Im images mistakenly tagged black people as gorillas was happening in 2015. The algorithm was fixed. Why did it exist? Because the database had more light faces than darker faces, so the database was dumb. 
And so these data dumbness is occurring all over the place as machine intelligence ingests more data, which contains incredible biases that we have unfortunately let sit out there for too long. So how do we change that? Um, I think we change that by rethinking a few things. And that is, where does technology evolve the quickest? And in the report, we pointed out that there's two regions. You see the red regions, the hot regions? That's where all this stuff is happening, right? This region of the country, New York. But if you flip the map, this is a map of inequality, uh, income inequality. If you flip it, you see the exact opposite, that where tech is not impacting is where poverty is growing the quickest, because the skills gap is so large. Um, this audience here is probably in the 0.01% of the most advanced people in the world. Uh, that said, the entire world is behind in computation, understanding the impact of Moore's law. And this is a, this is a, this is a very subtle intellectual privilege problem today. So when we look at what technology has done, it's been able to be extremely smart at optimizing our experience, and therefore making nothing we understand real or not real. And we all know it's happening, and it's amazing, but it's also quite disturbing. My mother, by the way, her favorite newspaper is the National Enquirer. So I'm always checking out the headlines. Uh, I, I just picked this up. Look out, Google. They know too. So is it just a divide related somehow to poverty and equality? I think it's hard to say they're related or it's causal or correlated, but there's something connected that we cannot miss. And that is that if you don't have access to computation, you are excluded. And if you don't understand what it can do, you're excluded. And so technology keeps shooting off without them, us. So what's the solution? Uh, I'm passionate about remote work. I'm at a company that is all remote, automatic. Who, remotes, who, who works remotely? That's quite a few. So uh, remote work is neat because it takes you out of these bubbles of tech. Uh, I guess I'm hopeful that uh, at Automatic, we're trying to figure out a world where world WordPress is a good design for all. How do we do that? We have to use the fact that we can go anywhere because we're remote. So for instance, uh, let's see, someone, 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 I was visiting Appalachia. And in Appalachia, I heard the story about how um, it was a coal miner who's teaching code to ex-coal miners. And he said, you know, you, you people are from the three-dimensional world. You're 3D. You live in cities with skyscrapers, you know? And, and if you're from a smaller city, you're in a town, you live in 2D. In 2D, you have, like, no skyscrapers, just streets. And he said, here in Appalachia, we live in 1D. There's one street, and we all live off of it. That's where I realized the neat thing about remote work is you're zero-dimensional. And by being zero-dimensional, you can travel anywhere. And so we're trying to use this advantage to go into all kinds of places anywhere in the world and to connect with people. And I can tell you that this experience of being remote is a very powerful way to reduce exclusion, because you can be including by just going anywhere you think is necessary. Now, this is my favorite quote by the lawyer Vernay Myers. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Uh, say this over to yourself. It's such a powerful idea. Because if you don't have both, nothing occurs. And so when you ask how to be more inclusive, it's quite easy. Just ask, where do you spend your time? Who do you hang out with? Look at the people in the room around you. Are they diverse in some way? If they're not, you're going to have to do something terrible to yourself. You're going to have to make yourself uncomfortable. And it's exciting to be uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, you say the dumbest things. Um, and you stumble, and you become stupid, and you become smarter and a better person through it, I believe. So all of you who are not found yourself in this way, enjoy it. It's so exciting. Um, I'm a big entertainment fan, uh, and I've been tracking all the movies that have put diversity and inclusion at the center of them, and they're doing very well financially. Uh, movies like Wonder Woman, directed by Patty Jenkins. Star Wars had a much more diverse cast. Uh, the Foreigner by Jackie Chan. Who's seen The Foreigner? The Foreigner, where the terrorists aren't dark-skinned people. That was brand new. Uh, and The Big Sick, of course. Um, and these are doing really well financially. This is teaching machine intelligence and the business world 
that this is a pattern to take note of. I like Kumail Nanjani's quote, there's so many movies from different points of view that are making a ton of money. Don't do it because it's better for society and representation, even though it is. Do it because you'll get rich. You'll get that promotion, right? This thinking seems crass, yet it sits at the center of how change will start to occur. And I believe that as we see more of these kinds of things, wonderful things will happen. I want to close on, uh, my mother went to see Black Panther. Uh, this was her review. It went kind of viral. Hi, John. Just came back from seeing Black Panther. It was very good. Um, and uh, we actually went to see Avengers last, me and my mom. I was in Seattle. My mom's like 83 years old. She's like, you know, a little woman with a cane. You know, we're walking out of Avengers. And I said, Mom, how was it? Oh, it wasn't as good as Black Panther. <laughs> you know? So anyways, um, thank you. And we'll have Hannah next, so please stay seated. <laughs> this is nuts. Look at all the faces. <laughs> wow, I'm so happy. I get to interview Hannah Beachler. Yes. Yeah, all right. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Good to be here. And this thing is a little weird, so you might see me kind of being a little weird. <laughs> so how's it been walking around this area? I'm sorry? How's it been walking around? Cool. Wandering we went and hung out at the auditorium and walked around some of the tents and ate and sat on the grass, and it was fabulous. Anything you know? catch your attention? I mean, I was just looking at everything. I mean, the area is beautiful, and I think everything has been great. I've been talking to some great people, and it's been, it's been awesome. Hmm. So my mother loved Black <laughs> Panther. Um, I'm sure you weren't surprised, though. What? I'm sorry. I I'm sure you weren't surprised. That your mother loved it? Yeah. Not it, really. It, it <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, that was part of what we tried to do was, you know, make it so everybody could love it. It wasn't really geared towards one specific anything. It was more about creating a feeling and a moment and... You know what I mean? I, I'm pretty into my emotions. I would call myself an emotionalist, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what drives me is, uh, you know, creating things from a place that people can relate to. And then that, you know, expands. Had you heard of Black Panther when you got the job? Or yes, I did. Oh. I, I had heard of the, the character and the comics, and I kind of knew it because I knew Marvel. I've certainly asked my son, who's 20, right away when I knew I was going to interview for the job that, oh, um, you know, tell me all about, you know, the MCU and, and all of that. And he was like, here's a Marvel dictionary. And I sort of started from there. So I knew of him, but over that 14 months, I really got to know him. <laughs> so a superhero. Superhero. 
Was your reaction positive, yay, superhero, or superhero? Um, I, my reaction to, to it being superhero? Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, I was really super excited because it was challenging. It's, you know, I've done so many things that are so different from each other that anything that is going to challenge me, I instantly want in on, you know? And working with Ryan Coogler, the amazing director, again for the third time, was, you know, without question, I was going to be involved with that. So I never thought I would ever do something like a superhero movie. That's not where I saw my career going. That's not what I thought I wanted to do. But then that's life. It's not really what you thought, think in the beginning. But as, you know, I started to get into it, I was like, you know, why not? I didn't think I would do a boxing movie. I didn't think I would work with Beyonce. I didn't think I would, you know, work on a little $1 million movie that would win an Oscar. Mm. So I don't generally go into anything thinking anything other than how do I make this work? Mm. How do I make this the best it can be? And, you know, for, for each film, it's, it's something different. So for Panther, there was a, a reason behind it for Ryan and I, and same with all the other projects. Mm. So you, you had to look a thousand years in the future. Mm -hmm. And you didn't come to Silicon Valley to look at that future. No. Talk about that. Well, first I had to look a thousand years in the past. Uh -huh. That was a big part of Wakanda was the honoring of the culture and the tradition and the diaspora, uh, the African diaspora, that really is what Wakanda is representational of. Um, so. I had to look backwards because I think the past is a very important bridge to what the future is. Um, and that needs to inclusion in, in design, in this world of what I was doing for Black Panther. Um, looking into the future, I didn't know, and you know what, honestly, I didn't know that Silicon Valley could ha help me for my needs. I didn't think that I was going to find in there, and honestly, I didn't really know much about it. I live in New Orleans. It's a very small town. I don't live in Los Angeles. I don't live in New York. Hmm. I live in a place where the population is like 250,000 to 300,000 people. Um, you know, I, I didn't know much about Silicon Valley. I kind of knew what I saw on TV. Sounds familiar. <laughs> but I didn't really know how that could help me create this this technology, which you would think was kind of crazy, because what I knew I needed to do was evolve something that Silicon Valley, to me, I felt had no interest in, which is this culture. Huh. So there was, you know what I mean? I, I, I felt like I kind of had to give uh, an autonomy and a, to this story and a narrative that at times is is restricted um, just in general by society, like the, the ability to tell, uh, a community's ability to tell their own story, how they want it told, um, and based on what they want it based on. So that was sort of me kind of being the person who made sure that the representation of the culture that we were digging into and creating a fictional one on top of it stayed to what I needed it to be, and I didn't know that Silicon Valley could help me. Now, I did reach out to a lot of experts mm -hmm. um, about uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, geology, geography, archaeology. Um, we talked to experts in architecture who were doing future cities, people who were sort of um, architectural archaeologists that could talk to us about some of the architecture, um, you know, uh, pre-colonial uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, going to South Africa, traveling all over South Africa for three weeks and sort of understanding that, because at the heart of Black Panther was the question of, what is it to be African? And it, so that's sort of, mm -hmm. you know, why I felt like I didn't want to go or need to go to, to Silicon Valley. Hmm. Um, I don't I, know if that is <laughs> like, and I mean, that's honest. That's the honest truth. Be and because I was so busy, I was like, you know, I'm just going to have to do this. I'm just going to have to figure this one out. <laughs> um, and I didn't really know a thousand years into the future. Here's the thing. It's hard enough to f go any amount into the future and understand what you 
think might happen mm. or how people would respond. So I found myself getting to this place where I started thinking about technology in the future, how Wakanda would use technology. Technically, Black Panther is placed in 2018. It's not sci-fi. It felt sci-fi because Wakanda, right. it, you know what I mean? We have to remember it's not science fiction. It's supposed right. to live in this universe, which is 2018. Huh. So I had to make sure it felt grounded enough that people weren't like, it's space. But it also had to be advanced enough where people thought, um, maybe this is something that's going to come around in you know, 50 years, 60 years or something. It's not impossible, hmm. you know? And then you had to add sort of with the vibranium, the, the fantasy of it all. So, um, you know, and I'm rambling, so. <laughs> I don't even know if I answered the question, but, you know, that's sort of, oh. I might have lost myself on you that. May, actually, when you were describing well, that, I remember walking my mom out of the theater because she can't walk very well because she has diabetes and her feet are really makes it hard, so she's walking really slowly and talking really slowly. And I remember when we just left the theater, she said, you know, Black Panther was so beautiful. All the scenery, everything was so beautiful. And it's a thing that stuck with her, how beautiful the movie is. And it's optimistic. And so where did that come from and how you were able to translate that? I mean, I like to do things that are beautiful. You know, and I, I think that's another part of Black Panther is changing this idea of narrative of how we see things. Uh, you know, it was a challenge to me of how I saw Africa, what I thought about Africa. Just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm an expert on <laughs> African culture, right? Um, so I really had to dig in and challenge myself about like, okay, well, what do I think? What are my biases? What was I raised with? How do, from my American experience, you know, this is a land that's a thousand miles away. And as far as I know, my ancestry begins and ends at slavery. And then the culture that came afterwards was this bastardized idea, or we were told it was a bastardized uh, culture. You know, we're not African, we're not American, so it became this bastardized culture in a sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you go through all of these different points in time um, throughout American history. So I needed to rediscover like what that was uh, a thousands of miles away from where I live mm -hmm. and how I'm connected to that, you know, because oftentimes you feel like the hyphenate between the African and American, you're really not either one. You know, so it was, what is it to be African? Because this is a movie, Wakanda's African, and it's not African-American. And, you know, one of the little things that Ryan was so brilliant at doing in the film with Killmonger's character, who's the villain, if you haven't seen it. Has everybody seen Black Panther? Is that a thing? <laughs> awesome. So Killmonger, um, played by the fabulous Michael B. Jordan, if you notice something about him is his names. And part of the reason behind him having so many names is because, you know, our American ancestry is that we have been given so many names. We were Negroes, we were black folk, we were colored, we were um, Afro-American, we were African-American. Um, and that's sort of how this has gone over time. So what Ryan did was he gave Michael Jordan the Indradaka name, but they also called him Eric. They also called him Killmonger. They also called him Eric Stevens. So he's that representation of African American, never having a true identity from different places and different people called him different things. And that's the tie back. And those are the types of things that we were trying to do. That is a piece of representation in a sense. And we'll get to representation cool. because I think that's mostly what we want to be talking about is, is how uh, that is so important in Black Panther, right. uh, it, you know, technologically, uh, scientifically, you know, through your STEM and then also socially and economically. And, and, and so there's so many little things that we did in there. I mean, it goes so deep into how we, we, we brought in the representation and that was one of them. And it was in such a small story way that you don't even really realize that's what's happening because Shuri calls him Eric Stevens, T'Challa calls him into Jaka. His father calls him, hmm. you know, uh, Ross calls him Killmonger. Hmm. His father calls him Eric, you know. Wow. So it's, everybody's, he doesn't have an identity and he's going to Wakanda to try to figure that out. Wow. And that's sort of the representation of where we are as sort of the lost tribe as we called it um, 
in a... <laughs> I'm such a Ryan Coogler fan, so I'm like, I can see that detail. I didn't see the it small when detail. you described it. Um, uh, when we were when we were talking last week about representation, yes, you mentioned the production designer Win Thomas, and I looked up Win Thomas. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard his name before. Um, he had, uh, um, and he has he has credits for Hidden Figures, A Beautiful Mind, Analyze This, all of Spike Lee's movies. So you mentioned seeing him on television or something. I, I saw he had, was nominated for an Academy Award for um, Mars Attack, the Tim Burton film. And I happened to be watching the Academy Awards that year, and I was like, oh, who's this black man <laughs> doing this thing that I want to do? And um, that was really the first time that I really saw that. I was like, oh my goodness, what is this? Um, because I'd always been a big fan of B Bernardo Bertolucci, who is an Italian director, his back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and in the 80s. And um, his designer, Fernando Scarfiotti, was someone who was really a big influence to me. He was this Italian man way back when, but my design aesthetic, you know, is highly influenced by his. But I, seeing him never made me feel like, yeah, I can do that because he's this Italian guy. You know what I mean? Like, of course he can. He's an Italian guy. Like, I'm this farm girl from Ohio you know, who literally runs around with bare feet and riding my horse to the store to get Jolly Ranchers when I was like six. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I get to that? Right. How do I get, to, well, there's no path for me there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of started thinking like, what are some of the other things that I could do where there might be a path that's still creative and that's how I had to think, knowing that that wasn't something that was for me. But then when I saw Win, which was much later in my life, um, I was, that's when I realized, like, you know what, I can actually go for this. I mean, that didn't actually mean that I could go for it, but seeing it certainly made me feel that way. Mm -hmm. And I took that chance, and that gave me an opportunity to get into this industry and really go far. I mean, as I got into it, I realized, like, oh, this is really hard. <laughs> I'm the only one, and I am the only one. And that's a really strange thing to think that you are the only fe black female who does this, mm. who does what I do. Mm. And at this level, mm -hmm. you know, there's one other one, Tony Barton, you know, and she works, she's an art director working on television for Marvel. Mm. And I kind of saw her on Twitter and I was like, ah, you know, like I want to be, let's be friends. And she's like, I don't even know you. <laughs> and I'm like stalking her on Twitter, like I want to be girlfriends. And she's like, okay, maybe don't. Maybe call my agent, <laughs> maybe don't. But we finally kind of, like I broke her down and she finally decided to be my friend. And we're kind of, we're kind of besties, don't quote me. And uh, don't go up to her and be like, Hannah said you were besties, because she'll be like, I don't know who she is. Um, so, but that's, you know, you, you want to find likeness, you want to find relatability. And when you look at communities, I think, you know, one of the other things, Two is when you look at communities who are associated with not like having a lot of tech and not, you know, having access to a lot of tech, uh, and you start relating, uh, you know, your economic status to your racial uh, profile, that all of a sudden, especially in poverty, the black community becomes associated with this idea of uh, not being tech savvy or wanting tech or having that type of thing. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Within their totally. community. And it's, yeah. and it's basically all based on accessibility. It's not there because how many representation is not just in front of what it, whatever it is, you know, or like throwing the pretty on it that seems to be representing a, a group or a culture, but actually having the voices creating it. Mm -hmm. You know, is it how, you know, you look at it like, was it important for me to be the production designer on something like Black Panther, hmm. you know, or the Infinity Wars designer Charles Woods, would he be able to have then done that? Hmm. And so I, I do believe that the, the representation uh, behind the camera, I'll say, because that's what I do. I mean, at behind the desk, I don't, <laughs> you guys stand or I don't, <laughs> well. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Um, however it goes, is is as important 
as creating an app or creating something, you know, specifically as having the voices there that can that then has the experience in those communities. Because mm -hmm. you really don't know what you don't know, and that's what I learned by going to Africa. Like I don't know what I don't know, and but I knew that I was going to look at it at, with beauty. I knew I was going to look at it f with the lens of of absolute. Um, modernism and beauty and capability, all the things that I wanted to put into Panther. Like, I wasn't looking for the commercial with the poverty-stricken children. I wasn't looking for the things that were told the continent is. I was looking for the joy and the pride and the dignity of the people that lived there. And, you know, that's the choice we make for wherever we are, because there are, I met people who lived in the rural parts of Africa just as much as people lived in the, the modern cities, like Johannesburg, and, and uh, you know, we were in Durban, we were in Cape Town. So it's, it's you know, you could see someone dressed in their traditional Zulu or uh, traditional Kosa and, uh, in, in the city. You know, just as much as you might see that in the rural areas. So I decided not only to find myself and realize that uh, I think I've been African this entire time, um, but that I, 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 I was determined to, to find all the beautiful things that I, you know, was told weren't there. Mm -hmm. You know, because that, that then really came back to who I am as a person. Hmm. You know what I mean? It really related back to who I am and how I felt about myself and the confidences I had. So it all kind of like, our fictional world building bleeds back into our realities. Could you, we have two minutes left. Could you share a non-fiction story you shared with me that moved me very much, which was about the director Ryan Coogler, who I'm a huge fan of. Mm -hmm. And I've always, when in, in Silicon Valley, we talk about leadership. Mm. You know, CEO or the product manager is the CEO of the product and all these CEO-ish things. I think of Ryan Coogler as one of the great CEOs of our time and creatives. <laughs> yep. and you, tell, you shared a story about him. Did you talk uh, about When that? I was talking to myself? Yes. So you obviously know I'm kind of weird. So I'm going to tell this story. Don't hold it against me. But so we're working on Creed and we're tech scouting, which is kind of you go to look at all these locations and you can spend all day. And we had stopped at this coffee shop. And I got my coffee, and everybody was getting their coffee, but I was kind of working out a problem. And when I'm trying to work out a problem or solve a problem, I talk out loud to myself, because that's the best way to do it uh, for me, apparently. And you know, my, my friends and stuff were like, poke fun at me, like, oh, you're crazy. You're talking to yourself. And so I, you know, sometimes I do, and I don't even know I'm doing it. So Ryan comes walking over to me, and he was like, are you talking to yourself? And I was like, you know, a little like, oh, you know what I mean? I know you and love you, but yeah. And the first thing he said, he looked at me and he said, that's a sign of a really healthy mind and a really intelligent person. And he kind of turned around and walked away. And I was kind of like ready to get the hit of like, oh, you're crazy, uh, you know, kind of funny joke, joke, but a little bit like of a slight. And that's not at all where his mind came from. It looked for the immediate positive thing about the thing that I was doing that sometimes people think is weird or could make you feel a certain way about yourself that eventually starts beating you down and, and making, you know, d defining who you are because you're hearing negative things about it. That is who Ryan is. He's the person that will constantly lift people up you know, will constantly, and he's not perfect, I promise. <laughs> There's days when I'm like, please make a decision, you have like two hours. Um, but, you know, and he, ha he does all the things that directors do that can, you know, completely bother you or things that are like amazing, but he's the type of person, like we would be on set for Warrior Falls, which was the big waterfall where they had the big fight. And, um, he gathered us all around in a big circle, you know, some people were in the water and we were, and he really told us why that scene was important. This is before we even started shooting. He really started to say why that uh, scene was important to him and really talked about having all the fictional tribes of Wakanda in one place and represented by all the references that we use of the tribes, the different tribes in sub-Saharan Africa and how that was a big a part of him really feeling complete. And, you know, you were holding hands and he's telling us all this and we're standing in this circle and you just feel like you can take on the entire world, mm -hmm. you know, at that point. So that's who he is as a director and my friend. 
and he's a really important voice because his perspective on, on anything and everything is the most unique perspective you will, I promise you, ever hear from anybody. If you ever get a chance to talk to him, talk to him because he will turn a situation and make you see it from a side you were never maybe even meant to see it from and all of a sudden your world opens up and so I can always and he would be standing here going like oh please stop but <laughs> but he is really that great so well, thanks for sharing that story what a leader yeah. and what a designer thank you everyone <laughs> thank you <laughs> wow <laughs> hey. at Google I.O. 2018, and it isn't over yet. Come back at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time for our live concert with Justice. They'll be debuting their new song, Stop. Tomorrow, we'll be back here at 8.30 a.m. with more sessions, sandbox demos, and special guest interviews. See you back here in one and a half hours. We'll leave now with Justice's new music video, Stop.